Just want to give you a little bit of background about um, how we got here. And way back, almost 10 years ago now, in 2005, uh, the County Commission recognized that there was a need to kind of put historic preservation on the net. The county up to that point really weren't recognizing historic preservation. We had Heritage Park, we had museum, this sort of thing, but we didn't actually have any active board or program dealing with historic preservation in the community itself in the county. So basically, um, they set something up, a task force to look at this, and the task force met for a couple of years, actually for three years, and then developed the, the idea that they should have a program for the county. So in 2008, then, the county set up a historic preservation program. And the, the, that group met and realized that we really need to get this thing much more organized, much more formal, and that sort of thing. And so basically, they worked up a whole package, a very comprehensive ordinance that was then put on the books in 2012. And the, book, the program was twofold. It was unincorporated because the unincorporated area, that's what the, the county commission, the governing body for, that, body for that, but also made it countywide. So basically, what, not only what we did in the unincorporated area could be spilled over into municipal areas, but also there could be a major coordination program of outreach and pulling things together. So all working together on historic preservation, which sometimes ignores jurisdictional lines. So basically, it's a two-part program. And that ordinance went, in, went on the books around, I guess, October of uh, 2012, set up a board that's, um, I think it's like eight or ten, ten people on it, and uh, a county commissioner is in charge to be uh, the chairman of it. That's where we have Charlie Justice now. Other commissioners in the past have chaired that, the board and the programs for the last ten years, but he is the current chairman of the Historic Preservation Program. And uh, the mission is, uh, is primarily outreach. Um, you'll notice today that we're looking, talking about computers. And it has to do with um, the way the program kind of evolved was we put together a major report on historic preservation several years ago in the county. Uh, not only documented the, the program, but also documented um, all the different things in the county that should be protected, both public and private. Made lists of that and put it all on a uh, CD and basically had mapped it all out and also had tied it to the, um, the master files up in Tallahassee, which I think you guys know about. And as you know, the, all these important historic properties are all filed with a master file in Tallahassee. And so the idea was to not only have, know locally what we had, but then also be able to not have to invent the wheel, but tie into the state system with the state files. So basically, that's what we're looking at is, um, today, that's what we have now, is that originally that consultant that put that whole cultural study together for us um, developed a CD listing all these properties. But it took us a while to actually do the GIS connection. I'm not trying to steal anybody's thunder in the presentation, but the point is, what I'm just trying to give you the bigger picture, which is therefore, you've got a map. You can go on the county's website now, find all these sites throughout the county, and then you can actually drill into it and tie into the state system. <laughs> this is pretty much we found, we thought that we were kind of like behind or in the middle of others in the state. But then when we had um, that speaker, I think at a last summit from Miami come in, he pointed out he had worked with not just Miami, but other communities in the state, was surprised to see what we were doing and, and actually felt that we were the only ones that had crossed over this line and actually put this kind of system in place. So what you're dealing with today then is something that pretty much is cutting edge, but you're going to find it very convenient. And we're actually moving on, building on that. We're working on um, a toolkit for how you actually work with properties and uh, protect them and, and do them correctly, uh, upgrading. We've also got, as you know, ordinance that's got a benefit for, uh, for taxes and things like that that's countywide. So you've got a lot of programs we'll probably talk about over time. But I think I just more wanted to do the opening remarks and give you an idea about why we're here today, which is then, um, I think John was helping some people do this, but um, when, when we get to John Barry's item, which I think is next, but uh, he'll tell you the, the coding so you can get actually onto the system. And when you're on the system, then he'll be able to work with you in that. So we've got the speakers, which is John Barry, which is a board member on the Historic Preservation Board. And basically, he is an architect and has a lot of experience in this. So he'll start off. And then we have Leroy uh, Bridges, who will then also talk about from the, um, if you want to call it, from Visit Florida point of view from there. They're also GIS program. Then he'll kind of layer into that. And you'll kind of get a really good feel, I think, for what's going on. And then we also have Brian Zimwalt, who is the from the county's GIS program, who actually can tell you actually how specifically how everything works out. So that's kind of the layout for the, the afternoon with a kind of break in the middle there. So um, 
With that, I think I'm going to now turn it over to John, who will actually start the program and start working with you on things. So it's going to be really a, a cool afternoon, and you're welcome to the restrooms or across the hall and that sort of thing. You're welcome to do that as you need to. And then uh, I don't know if we have refreshments. It's probably the, the water fountain, right? <laughs> okay, John, I think you're on. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see a full room. and. Uh, as we had hoped, there's a bunch of realtors in here, so hopefully some of that uh, uh, publicity that we handed out there uh, is going to work in attracting you and then spreading the word throughout the realtor community. Let me start um, by thanking um, a bunch of people that helped make all of this possible. First of all, uh, thanks to the Pinellas Realtor Organization. Um, they have loaned us uh, this auditorium free of charge. Um, and also we have some refreshments in the back, some water and some uh, some other goodies back there, and we can thank the uh, uh, Pinellas Realtor Organization Affiliate Business Partners. I'm a member of that. That's why I wear this badge when I'm in this building. Um, it's an organization that's dedicated to providing services to the real estate community and realtors in particular, affiliate business partners. So thanks to them. Now, in these situations, uh, folks like myself uh, and Leroy, we get up to, to stand up and talk and make presentations and people undoubtedly will leave here with some impression of us one way or the other. The truth of the matter is, is that as presenters, um, we are, we are pre uh, presenting to you a lot of hard work by other people and I've always been a believer in the co course of my career to give credit where credit is due. So I'm going to say, say thanks to a bunch of people who made all of this happen that we're going to experience this afternoon. To start off with, I want to recognize Liz Freeman, Liz Stand Up, Marcella Fossett, uh, Christopher Moore, you're new to the team. They are planning department folks that um, give the Historic Preservation Board a lot of support in terms of their actual hands-on execution of the crazy ideas that we come up with at board meetings. Um, Alan Shellhorn is part of that. Alan's not here today, but he's also someone. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Marcella. Um, on the technical side, let me see, who did I miss here? Um, on, the, on, the, on the web side, there's two people who aren't here today, Malia uh, Crucera and Terry Murray, who, had, uh, who did all of the kind of walking through, if you will, of the changes to the website. They work on the county website. They spent a lot of time with us updating the website, which I'm going to present to you momentarily. And then finally, last but not least, um, to the technical side of the crew, it's, is it BizTech Services? Is that the right gang that, that is there in, in the county? And it's Brian Zumwalt, who is one of our speakers. Brian, stand up. Steve Clark um, is another contributor. Kelly Dickey, Tony Smith, and Mike Dawson. Those are the people in the county who support the Historic Preservation Board. And I, for one, want to say thank you to all of them for making all of this possible. OK, um, so let's get rid of this thing. I can hit escape and get out of that. And what do I punch now, Brian? There we go. All right, the Wi-Fi network in this building, if you have not logged on, is Pro Wi-Fi, P-R-O Wi-Fi. So you can search on it on your computers. It may take a minute or two for you to be able to log in. There's no um, password necessary. So just go to Pro Wi-Fi. Once you're logged in, you want to click on, in the upper uh, corner here, uh, you want to type in County dot org forward slash historic and that should take you to the page that you see on the screen here in front of you okay now we've got roughly 25 minutes worth of time here and so what I'm going to be presenting to you is the revamping or restructuring if you will of the historic uh, preservation page um, I won't spend a lot of time saying where we were before, but when I joined the board um, two and a half years ago, um, I looked at, before coming to the first meeting, I looked at the web page, and suffice it to say, it um, had a lot of information, but I wasn't comfortable in the, the way I thought, the way my mind worked, and the way I thought it should work for users, because I, I own every book for dummies that there is when it comes to computers and, and uh, handheld devices, that sort of thing, and I thought, well, let's see what we can do with this. I presented that idea to the board and asked them, in fact, if they shared my thought about reorganizing it, and it, they did, and so as a result of about now a year and a half's worth of work, um, we're ready to, uh, to launch this today. 
So for those of you who are, haven't got there yet, we'll, we'll get started with this. If you do have questions, if I say something you don't understand or I'm going too fast, raise your hand and we'll take the questions. It's not going to be, we like to have this as interactive as possible, okay? So when you uh, type in pinellascounty.org uh, forward slash historic, you will get on the landing page or the home page. Now what you'll see featured obviously in that yellow box in the center are meetings. Today, here it is, the summit meeting March 18th. Board meetings and other meetings that occur, in this case we've got the Historic Preservation Board, we've got the Grants Subcommittee right now. There is a subcommittee within the Board Director, or the uh, Historic Preservation Board, which is working on grant applications. We also have the subcommittee um, for summit. You've seen the results of, of our, our work there. So anything that's going on in terms of meetings going forward, you'll see it immediately in front of your eyes when you land on the page. Now one of the new features that is there that wasn't there before is on the right hand side, and you can see that there is, um, in fact, let me turn this on because I like this little device here. On the right hand side, this is the announcement about the Historic Preservation uh, Summit and Training. That was one of the devices. Um, what you see down below in the, uh, the next box here is a direct link to the interactive map. That's next on our program and we're going to have a lengthy presentation by Brian about the, the interactive map. Um, also one of the more important documents that has uh, been developed over the course of time about Pinellas County historical background is there. It's a direct link to that particular report. So we may change this from time to time. Obviously the summit thing will go away up in the upper right hand corner here. But there are various things. There's a link here to Heritage Village, as you can see, a link here to Fort DeSoto Park. Wow, they got a lot of stuff on here that I didn't see until today, and some stuff from Wheaton Island. And this, this, we, we, the, the folks that I mentioned crediting here were working on this thing last night. Um, they hate phone calls from John Barry, but that's life. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, then there's a little uh, 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 section in here where there are videos, and this is the preservation summits. The past summits have been, at least one of them has been on video. Have both of them been on video? One, the last one was videotaped. This one is being videotaped. So by, way, by the way, watch your language um, <laughs> because these guys are, have got you on microphone. Um, so we've got, uh, you'll have access to that if you want to play back any of what happens here. And there's a video on there about the Turner Bungalow relocation to Heritage Village, which is a pretty interesting uh, little video if you had not had time to, uh, to look at that. Um, we also thought it might be useful to have a direct link to the application form for certificate of appropriateness and the review process. So those are kind of direct links on the front page. Now the content is over here. And let's talk about the first drop down, which is History Comes Alive. History Comes Alive, one of the things that I think the board identified very early on in our existence is that there is, um, we are underrepresented in the world of tourism, and yet we live in one of the now currently most successful and, and accessible and accessed tourist attractions in the United States, if not on the planet, and that is Pinellas County and the beaches that we have. But guess what, folks? We all know that it rains, even when you go to the beach, and there are other things to do after you've turned red and you finally realize, I can't put any more SPF on my body, I will fry. So I've got to do something else. Why not go and visit historic places? So one day we looked in one of the pamphlets that uh, the, conve the old Convention and Visitors Bureau handed out, and I was looking for historic places. I found in the literature one little block about Yay Big that listed five historic places in Pinellas County. Three of them were hotels. The Vinoy, the Don Cesar, right? So, I, and I have nothing against the hotels, don't get me wrong. They're smart, they're historic, they use that as a marketing tool. What we want to do with the board is bring historic tourism alive. So the first step in that is historic tourism, okay? And we click on there, and golly, there ain't much happening. I talked to a lady here in the audience today uh, who's here, who's interested, or yesterday, I'm not sure if he's, she's here yet, she's interested in planning historic tours. Anybody that you know who is interested in that, we certainly would be supportive of that. Now, we're a board, we don't have the resources other than a lot of encouragement and information, but we would hope that we can populate historic tourism 
with people who start to offer tours of historic places in Pinellas County, okay? Obviously, St. Pete is already well organized. So we put a link in there to Pre Preservation St. Pete so that we can get, um, uh, get people informed about that. But our hope in the long term is, is that we will be able to populate this section, historic tourism, with tours in other places in Pinellas County. So Tarpon Springs, Palm Harbor, Oldsmar, if you guys have got stuff, get it to us and we will be happy to put whatever links we can on our website to your facilities in the effort to publicize it, okay? Any questions about that? All right, we do have, as, as part of this list, um, a list of the historical and cultural museums and education centers. Now, the staff has recently vetted this. This is one of the reasons it took us a year and a half to get uh, this thing up and published, is we had a lot of vetting to do to be sure that whatever, as much of what we put on the website as possible was accurate and current. Um, we don't profess to be perfect, and it's quite possible that there is old information here. If that is the case and you see something, by all means bring it to our attention and we will do our best to correct it as quickly as possible. I, I should point out that the folks that I introduced at the beginning of this presentation um, from the county staff, they are not dedicated to the Historic Preservation Board. Would that they were, but they aren't, okay? So when we get these requests in, we have to get in the queue, if you will, um, and, and feed that, our requirements into all of their other requirements because they have full-time jobs and they report to people who prioritize information and their work assignments. So we'll be happy to be a conduit to receive it, distribute it, and get it into the system as quickly as possible. We've got good folks working for them. I love them to death, and, and I think we'll be able to do a good job for you as far as that's concerned. So on to the next one, uh, historic places. Obviously, we've got some well-known historic places in the county. Heritage Village, Wheaton Island, uh, Brooker uh, Creek uh, Preserve, Fort DeSoto Park, National Register of Historic Places. Now, this is interesting, a document that we found recently. And it's, um, it's fairly mundane in terms of its presentation, but it is a list of all of the buildings in Pinellas County that are on the National Register of Historic Places. I hasten to add that that does not mean that any one of these buildings is protected. There are a couple of buildings on here that face the danger of demolition. The Bellevue, uh, the Biltmore uh, is one of them. I said, did I say Bellevue? Yeah, Bellevue yeah. Biltmore. Yeah, okay. Um, but the point is, is that there's a, a lengthy list. You can see there's 16 pages of it here. So this is kind of a good jumping off point for searching and, and, and visiting various sites in Pinellas County. We're thinking at some point in time we want to make this more attractive graphically, but right now it's information that's available, it's accurate, and so we wanted it to be on the, on the website. Um, and then research collections and archives. Um, the Heritage Museum Guide to Archives and Library is now a link that is active, so you can go there and search for that information. And chronological mileposts. Um, for those of you who are, who, are, who are like I am, I like sequential logic progressions. Um, here's the answer to your dream. It'll take you through the history um, from beginning to end, going all the way back to uh, before the year 1533, for those of you who are really curious, okay? Uh, so that information is there, okay? Uh, so I'm going to get that one back up. The next one is an interactive map. I'm going to skip over that for a moment because that's our next presentation and Brian is going to take you uh, through a uh, walkthrough of that. Uh, obviously, one of the things that we try to do is always at the board level, and I know that you folks do locally, is to promote historic preservation. There is a widespread misconception in the general public that historic preservation is costly and um, it's a roadblock and that it's, it, it doesn't do good things for a community, that it's harmful. And yet this study, Economic Impasse of Historic Preservation, is actually was done by the state of Florida. It's a number of years old, this study. Nonetheless, it documents what happens when communities embrace historic preservation. 
Now, we've got local examples of that. I happen to live in St. Pete in the historic Old Northeast. That speaks for itself. The Kenwood District in St. Petersburg speaks for itself. But people generally, when they hear about historic preservation, they get nervous, their knees shake, they start to sweat, all that kind of stuff, because they're afraid it's going to be harmful to them from the standpoint of the value of their property or the, the perceived devaluation of their property. Um, so here is a resource that you can share with other people to help them understand what are the benefits of historic preservation. How am I doing? I got about 15 more minutes here, okay? Um, preservation resources, okay? What we did here is we said, okay, well, where are, where are the places that resources are important? We got listings at the national level, the state level, the Pinellas County and local level. We got certified local governments, codes, preservation programs, so on and so forth. I'm going to touch on just a couple of these very briefly, okay? The national takes you to a link that can give you access to the National Trust for Historic Preservation site, the, the National Main Street program, the National Register, okay, where you can search out other buildings. We've put the buildings in here already that are uh, on the National Register that are in Pinellas County. And of course the National Alliance for, National Alliance, I'm sorry, for Preservation Commission. Um, all right, so preservation resources, um, state level, um, you've got a whole bunch of things here. The Florida Division of Historical Resource Publications, uh, Florida Trust, uh, the Florida Preservation Organizations, Office of Cultural and Historic Programs. All of those are just direct links rather than us, I mean, we're not trying to duplicate this. If you want to go there, you can use our site, hit the link, it'll take you there, um, and you can access any information that you might be looking for. Um, let's see, I guess I go back here, don't I? Okay. Uh, let's just uh, scroll down here, uh, Pinellas County and local. Um, we've got the City of St. Petersburg Ur Urban Design. Get this full screen. Uh, the City of St. Petersburg Urban Design Historic Preservation Division. There's a link uh, to their site and local participation in Pinellas County. Let's just uh, click on that for a second and see where that takes us. Here's a list of historic preservation organizations um, in the county. Okay, and you can see what they have in the way of uh, ordinances or, doc or documentation or standards, all that sort of thing, okay? And that list is for the county. Um, site, let's go to the Site Preservation Toolbox. We'll get out of there, sorry. Site Preservation Toolbox, okay. Um, when, we, when we think about the toolbox, um, I always think about it as something is, that you can open it up literally as a toolbox and it's got information in there that is useful to you. One of the things that is really important, and, and from my perspective all the time as an architect, is the visual appearance of historic structures and then what's been done to them to modernize them or to maintain them. Um, one of the buildings that I maintained or, very, or restored early in my career was a building, the original Bowery Savings Bank that was designed by the architects McKim, Mead and White, built in New York City in 1895. And it had been in the possession of the bank all the way into the 1980s when, when I did that project. They had some of the, the most incredible ironwork in there that you could possibly imagine. And the way it was maintained was with paint. Seven coats of paint by the time we uncovered it in 1982. Oh, okay. When we stripped away the paint, we discovered an inventory of original bronze metalwork on stairways, the vault that was still in the room, all over the place. I mean, it was just incredible. Anyway, so the visual tools are important. And so one of the things that we've got here and we're looking for more, by the way. The reason I want to share this with you is because we're looking for more of these that we can post on the, on the website. And hopefully it's going to open up here for me in just a second. There we go. Okay. Uh, this is the old Palm Harbor design review manual. And as I say, I, I'm a visual person, so I get past all the words, and I get to, we get past the history, and it's got some stuff in here about process, but eventually, you get to, where are we going to go here? Here we go. We get to things about historic preservation that are useful to people. Window patterns, decoration around windows. How many of you go around neighborhoods and you see the shutters that are twice as big as the windows, but they got a flamingo on them? Oh, I like flamingos, so I'm going to put one on my shutter. 
okay? So these are the kinds of guidelines that are useful. Here's how many of you have seen this porch and then next door to it is a porch that looks like that. Yep. It's cute, but it doesn't make any sense because that can't hold up the roof structure above it. There's a logic to architecture, okay? So these are the kinds of things that we like to have as tools available not just to us as architects, but to you folks in the community who interact at whatever level you do, your local boards, your local clubs, or whatever, um, about historic preservation and restoring things to what they used to be, okay? You need the ammunition. These are the kinds of documents and guidelines that are useful to people. So that's on there. Uh, we also now, as a board, have begun to have uh, submitted to us certificates of appropriateness for uh, development that is going on within the purview of the board. Remember, we are the unincorporated portion of Pinellas County. Um, but we are having these applications. So what we've done is we have a review process that is published and available to you here and on the front page of the website that tells you what that process is. So it's clear up front for anyone who wants to undertake an alteration or a design of a new building in a historic neighborhood, that sort of thing. Here is the process by which your application will be reviewed, okay? In addition to that, we've got the Certificate of Application, uh, Certificate of Appropriateness Application, and I don't know what that is, I'm gonna cancel that. This is the application that would have to be filled out and it's submitted to staff and then staff under the auspices of Liz Freeman and her, her folks, um, they will do a review in the county. They will contact whatever county agencies need to be contacted. They will write a report and they present it to the board for action. Okay, so all of this process is laid out and it's now available to you on the website. So that takes care of the site preservation. Okay, board activities. Since we are a legislated part of Pinellas County, we are governed by things like the Sunshine Law and other rules about the charter that was given to us by the county commissioners when they established the board. We have rules and procedures. So the first thing you can find is a list of the board members. That's a current list of the board members for any of you who would be interested in who, who we are. And, um, there's a little bit about the board. Um, Brian, in his opening remarks, gave you some indication of what that's, what that's all about. There's some more information here if you take time to read it and some links to uh, some other activities here. Uh, agendas and minutes. Again, because we are a public organization, our, our meetings are open to the public. All you have to do is show up and sign in and you're welcome to attend the meeting, okay? We haven't had a lot of attendance. That's not a comment either way. People are welcome to come if they choose to. The people who usually come are the ones who have business before the board. It's, uh, unless you're a real uh, historic preservation nut, you might not want to sit in on a lot of these meetings um, because we, we do discuss some pretty mundane kinds of things from time to time. Nonetheless, after every board meeting, there is a set of minutes published. That's from the last meeting all the meetings from the, uh, December, and it goes all the way back to uh, about March of 2005, something like that. And uh, then there's a little blurb on the uh, summit and the meet, <laughs> excuse me, the minutes from the meeting from our last uh, summit subcommittee meeting. So all of that is there. It's open, it's accessible, readable. You can uh, click on it and get to it and uh, you're all done, okay? If you want to know what the schedule is, there it is for 2015. We basically meet on the third Wednesday of every month in the morning at 9 o'clock. We generally wrap up somewhere before noon, depending upon the length and complexity of the agenda that's before us. Um, and then we, we break, for example, in March, rather than have a morning meeting, we, we, we did not have a board meeting this morning. This is our meeting, which is the summit, okay? And looks like I'm doing okay time-wise here. Um, Rules and procedures. There are rules and procedures by which we try to conduct ourselves <coughs> as a board. And they're here. They were adopted first in August of 2013, revised um, last December. Again, it's, I'm not going to spend any time going through the details of this. It's there for anyone who wants to read it. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's up to you. We welcome you to do that, to, to get in, as informed as possible. 
Um, we do have two subcommittees working, as I mentioned earlier, very briefly, and I won't go into a lot of meaning, but the Historic Preservation Board Grants Subcommittee. We're seeking grant money right now, and the grant process, um, if, if for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a lengthy, drawn-out process. You submit now, they review it next year, and they get the money in like 2018. I'm only exaggerating by a year, okay? Um, it's a lengthy process. What the, I think the subcommittee um, has, has targeted is we're going to look at historic bridges in Pinellas County um, that, are, are, that are of historic merit that we think uh, we want to be sure are being preserved. So we want to, uh, we want to try to do, get some grant money <coughs> to, to uh, do a study about that and publish some information on it. So that's what the grants committee is doing. And then the last one is the summit subcommittee. The results of our labors are here today. We, we sit and meet about where can we find a room at, at, lo, at no or low cost, all that sort of thing. Um, and then last uh, but not least is the contact us sheet, um, feedback and comments. So what I said earlier, if um, during the course of this meeting you have a question that isn't answered, you discover that there's some inaccuracy in information that is presented to you that we're not aware about. As I said, we've been trying to vet all of this um, over the course of the last year and a half, and we feel pretty good about what we've put up there in terms of accuracy, um, but we're, we're human beings and, and uh, people sometimes have faulty memories, so they, they're, it's possible there are mistakes in there. If they are, we want to correct them as quickly as we possibly can. So you can contact, contact us um, through this with forms and feedbacks here. All right, um, so that is the revamped uh, website. Are there any questions or comments before we go on to the next uh, phase of our presentation? Okay, I think it's pretty clear, hopefully, that uh, um, I, I always consider myself to be the, the, the crash test dummy in these kinds of things. Um, I have a fairly simple and straightforward mind, and if it makes sense to me, then I feel like it's, it has a good chance of making sense to other people. So I hope that that's where we are. We welcome your feedback by all means. Um, this is a live document, um, and there is information that isn't here that we're still, we continue to work on, but um, I have to say again, congratulations and a big thank you to the support staff because um, there's been a lot of hard work done here and I'm very proud of the accomplishment and I'm proud to share it with you guys today. So that concludes my presentation. What I'd like to do now is, uh, we're, we're right on schedule here. Um, what I'd like to do now is introduce um, our, our next speaker and the next part of our presentation. Um, and where Brian is going to talk to you about the interactive map. I'm going to leave this on the screen. You can go for there. But let me introduce Brian Zumwalt. Brian is a geographic information systems manager for Pinellas County. He is responsible for the county's spatial data mapping and applications. He previously served in the same role for the Tampa Bay Water, a regional uh, utility that provides drinking water to 2.5 million people in the Tampa Bay area. Prior to Tampa Bay Water, Brian uh, was a consultant with PBS and J Atkins, where he worked on various high-profile GIS projects for clients such as FDOT and FEMA. Brian has been a lifelong Pinellas County resident and is a graduate of the University of Florida's Warrington College of Business. Brian Zumwalt. Thank you for having us back. Um, we were here six months ago, roughly, at, the la at one of the previous summits, and we presented to you our historic sites map. And what I'd like to do is reintroduce that to you today um, and kind of give you some of the newer functionality that's built into the mapping interface. Uh, first, I'd like to thank John and the Historical Preservation Board for having us here today. Uh, thank you. I mean, it's really an honor to be here and present to you guys. Um, I'd also like to call someone out in the crowd that's not suspecting it right now. Um, Jerry Antosi, were you not a teacher in your former life? Yes, I was. <laughs> Thank 25 you. years. You're part of the reason that I'm up here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> so with that, uh, what I'd like to do is introduce to you our historic sites database. Um, I, there's a handout that was available in the front. Hopefully everybody took one. Um, if not, I can get you a copy after the summit. Uh, but what it has on there is the URL to the historic sites um, uh, application and you can also get to it from the website that John just showed you the historic sites uh, app off of Pinellas County so there's a link over here to the interactive map and if you click on that link it will bring you up to kind of a landing page 
And there's another button here that says View Historic Sites Location Map. And what I'm going to do is kind of give you an overview of the map and show you some of the tools that are available in it. And I have here with me also Steve Clark, who is the lead developer on this application from my department. Uh, and he's going to run you through the second half of the presentation, which will deal with how to query the database and how to get information out of the system. So when you go into the mapping interface, the first thing you're going to see is you're going to get a countywide map that has basically a lot of dots on it. And each one of those dots represents a historic site in the county. Um, what I'd like to do before we start interacting with the map is kind of give you an overview of all the different functions that are in here. Um, first of all, everybody familiar with geographic information systems? You guys, obviously, you're working with Zillow and Google Maps and all that kind of stuff. This is not very dissimilar from some of those systems. So if you've worked in those systems before, you're going to find this very easy to use. But you know, the first thing you'll notice is there's a zoom in and zoom out functionality. You can zoom down as close as you want in the county. Um, if you want to zoom into a cluster of sites, you can do that. And the farther you zoom, the more level of detail you're going to get um, in, into those areas. Uh, also on the left hand side over here, besides zoom in and zoom out, there's a home button. That home button, if you click on it, will bring you back out to the default extent, which is essentially the county. There's also another neat button on here, which is essentially a, a, a button that will find your current location. So if you happen to be on your mobile phone or have your laptop with you and you hit that, it's going to actually find you, find relatively close to where your current location is. So you can actually see all the historic sites that are surrounding your current location. And I don't see that we have any in this particular location, do we? <laughs> all right, so I'm going to back out. The other thing you can do, um, you see all the little dots on the maps. Each one of those dots is interactive. So if I want to click on one of those dots, it's going to bring up the underlying information for that historic site. You're going to get the parcel ID, the site ID, which is in the historic registry, the site name, which is kind of the common name of the site. A lot of them are just addresses because they don't have names. But if there's a name such as the Vinoy or the, you know, whatever, that will be there as part of the common site name. Uh, whether or not the site has been destroyed. If there's a survey number associated with that, that'll be there as well. The year built, uh, some of the years are circa, which means approximate. Some of them are exact years, and you can search on those as well. Uh, the style, the exterior plan, um, just there's probably about 25, 30 different attributes in here that are associated with that historic site. Uh, the architect, um, different types of themes, sub-themes. If there's any attachments associated with that historic site, say we have a picture or a survey or something that's in our database, that will actually be available as well. And then at the bottom of that, that record that we just clicked on, there's also a link out to the property appraiser. So for you guys that are into real estate and historic real estate, if you click on that link, it will actually take you directly to the property appraiser record and that will give you all the information straight from uh, PAO. So that's some of the you know, functionality built into each one of those site um, marks that are on the map right there. Now we've got some other things that are available on the map too. Um, up here in the right hand corner you'll notice there's about six different tools, six or seven different tools that are available. Um, the first one is a base map selector. Let's say I want to see aerial photography and not just a street map. Um, I have an option up here to actually turn on aerial photography and very similarly I can zoom down into these locations and interact with the map and see aerial photography, kind of see what's on the ground there. Um, and you can change, there's lots of different base maps that are available. I can, you know, there's, let me see here. There's, you know, just street maps, there's canvases, there's, there's a lot of different um, options there for base maps for what you want to see underneath that data. I'm going to turn back on the streets because that's kind of the easiest one to see. The second tool in here is a legend. Uh, right now we just have basically two, two things available in the legend. You've got your historic sites, which is your marker, and then you've got your parcel boundary, which you know, we've, we've overlaid on top of the map. Uh, the third tool up here is a layer list. Uh, if I click on that, it's going to give me kind of the two, again, we only have two layers in the map right now, historical sites and parcels. But this is actually pretty cool. What you can do in the layer list 
is actually open up the entire attribute table of the, of the database. So I can actually interact with this, not only in a map interface, but also in like a spreadsheet format. So what I'm going to do is bring up this spreadsheet. Essentially, this is all the data that's on the back end of the database. I can click on one of these records and hit zoom to, and it's going to take me right to that property and highlight it on the map up here for me. So, you know, you can interact with the map not only in a spatial way but on the, in the GIS interface, but you can also interact with the data kind of in a spreadsheet tabular format. Um, we've got a measuring tool on here. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm really interested, and I don't know why you guys would use this, but it is available. Uh, if I want to measure between, you know, sites, if I want to see the distance between two sites or the distance from my location to another site, um, I can click on the map and actually measure, and it'll give me, you can see it changing up here. You know, tell me how many miles I am away from, you know, that, that location that I dropped the point. Uh, you, can, you can bookmark sites. You know, let's say I'm really interested in this site here. Let's see what this is. So this is a food bank site, historic in nature, Italian <laughs> Renaissance. Okay. So what I can do is open up my bookmark tool, and I can put in here uh, food bank site and add that. And what that allows me to do is if I go back out to my home extent and I come back to my bookmarks and I click on that food bank site, that link that I just created, it's going to take me right back to that spot. So I can kind of manage my own areas of interest, if you will. We have a print functionality. This is very, very basic. If I want to make a map. Yes, sir. Can I interrupt? Sure. Um, if you go back to that, so the question would be, then if you can bookmark it, yeah. can you save it to a file that you access tomorrow? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think it's local within the, the current session that you're in, so I don't think that you can actually take that with you. The one thing we can do, though, is if you guys have bookmarks of specific historical sites that you want to have highlighted there, we can certainly put that into the map. So they're already there. So you don't ha it's not kind of a user defined. Okay. So. But if I, was, if I was searching and I wanted to save a bunch of these, when I left the website in that session, that information would be lost. It would be lost. Okay. It is specific to that session, that browser session. Yeah. It's, you know, this, this type of functionality is more if you want to take somebody on a tour. I want to show you, you know, 25 different sites, and I don't want to have to navigate to each one of those sites. It allows you to save, you know, those navigation. You, you can just click on it instead of having to navigate to it. The sixth tool we have on here is a print functionality. This allows me to essentially create a map. Um, I can come in here and put food bank site. That's going to be my map title. And I can select many different layouts. Um, you know, I can do a 11 by 17 or a letter or landscape. Um, and what it, that will do for me is actually create a PDF file. And I'll hit print. And what the system's going to do is generate a PDF that, that I can then bring with me or print out. And let's see if this takes. All right, there it is. <laughs> so it just created that file for me. If I open it up now, it's in a PDF format. And then I can print it out to my local printer or take it with me or email it to somebody. And then the last one is actually an information tool. This essentially is the same information that's on the handout in front of you, uh, only embedded into the website. So if you need to go back for reference and you don't have that handout that we gave at the beginning of the summit, you can always come here within the application and get that same information. And it's all available right there on the website. A couple other features that I'd like to show uh, before I have Steve come up here and take you through some of the other uh, querying functionality. Uh, we also have a, if, if you're just interested in an address, I want to find an address. We have a quick search for address. Uh, 315 Court Street is the one I'll use. And it'll go and find that and bring me right to that location. And this one happens to be a historic site because it's the county courthouse. Um, 
but it's kind of a nice quick address search if you do have a, a historical site address. Um, that, let me see, other features on the map. At the bottom, if you really, really want to take it with you, you've got a latitude, longitude if you needed to provide that to somebody. There's a scale bar in the bottom left-hand corner. There's also a link back to the Historic Preservation Board site. So if you happen to get here from the main page and you want to go back to, the, back to it, just click on that and it'll bring you right back to the Historic Preservation site. Yes, ma'am? How often is the information updated in the database? Uh, let's just say periodically. Uh, right now, the planning department is actually doing an exercise where they're going out to the municipalities to actually get updated information uh, to put into the database. So um, I would say, maybe, Les, you're going to have to help me out, maybe a couple times a year. We just, I think we contacted each of the cities, and I know some of you all are here today um, to try to have everybody get the information that we had in the database. And we'll probably be continuing to coordinate with the cities in an ongoing fashion to make sure that we have every opportunity to keep this current. But it's, it's driven by people providing us with information and updates. Right. And so, you know, John indicated we have the ability for you all to go in and send an email to um, show you the area we can contact us. That email goes comes to us, and if you say, hey, this is wrong or this is no longer there, we can go and get with Brian's staff to update the uh, database. Uh, I'm not sure, Liz, that they got you on the microphone up here because of the recording, so I'm just going to kind of repeat what you said, and that is that uh, in terms of staff, Liz and, and the folks that work with her on historic preservation uh, information, um, are we've gone out to, the, to local jurisdictions to update it as best we can. We got a lot of feedback, but there is more to come. And as I said earlier, as new information becomes available to us, we will try to incorporate this in the site. Liz and her staff will be the conduit for that. Um, so it's an ongoing process. Um, it's the kind of thing where I suppose if you think about uh, historic buildings, if a historic building becomes eligible for historic status, obviously it's going to be added as soon as we're, that information is passed along to county staff. So it's an ongoing process, but to say that it's, you know, we're going to do it once or twice a year, is, it's probably not going to happen like that, okay? And What's the criteria for something on this map being considered historic? Uh, that's another question I'm going to defer to Liz. The question is, what's the criteria for defining what a historic site, how a historic site should be included in the database? I believe um, this database is developed from the Florida Master Site file. It's properties that are in the Florida Master Site file. Is that correct, John? Um, yes, it's, it, this is developed from data that's collected by the state in the master uh, database, master site plan database. So it comes from the state of Florida. Well, they, well, what Brian was saying earlier is the, the folks in county staff began to see this as a potential resource and brought it to our attention. And over the course of the last year and a half, we've developed it into this interactive map that you see before you. So the source is the state of Florida. If a, if a building or structure gets nominated and becomes eligible for status and it's not on there, it's a new designation that the information is going to be passed along to the local jurisdictions, in which case then we would add it to the database. That's kind of how it works. Um, if you want to nominate something, you wind up nominating it to the state of Florida. You can also nominate it to us and we'll facilitate that process. Okay? The one other thing I'll mention related to your question uh, about the municipalities is that we're actually building kind of a back end of this where we, we would like to kind of flex it out to the municipal partners so they can come in and modify their own data. Uh, we actually have a, another website that looks just like this where it's not just reading the data from the database, but you can actually write to the database and add new sites and modify all the attributes that are in the database. So um, for those of you that are coming here from, you know, Pinellas Park and Largo and some of those other places, we would like to kind of flex this out to you guys so that um, you can start managing that on your own as well. Um, the one thing, the other thing I want to mention about the site, and I should have said this up front, but this is also available in, if you have an iPhone or a Android or a mobile device and you go to this site, and I have an emulator here so you'll see what this is going to look like. But it, it works perfectly on a mobile device as well. Um, it's going to format it for the device, but you can take this with you on the road if you need to access this information. Um, 
And just the way I was interacting with it in, in the browser, it will also do this on your phone where you can pull up that information. Um, the nice part about that is, you know, you can be walking in downtown St. Pete and click your locate button and, you know, the map will take you right to your location. You can see everything that's right around you straight from your phone. So um, same functionality, same button, same everything, just formatted in a way where it's, it's on your mobile device. And that should work for Apple, Android, uh, Windows, any, any type of device that has a mobile browser. Um, back to the site. Let's see here. What I'd like to do now is bring up uh, Steve Clark. Steve is the lead developer of this site. He was the one that actually uh, built a lot of the functionality that you see here today. Um, I'm going to have him take us through. There's a really neat part of this website where you can actually query the database and see things like, I want to see a site that's of a particular year or has a particular architect or is of a certain style. Um, I'm going to have Steve come up and show you how to work those queries so that you guys can actually interact with the database, not just from a mapping perspective, but actually ask the database questions. So with that, here's Steve. Thanks, Brian. appreciate it. And thanks uh, for the Society for having us out today. Um, done a lot of work with this over the past, I don't know, four or five months. And um, the cool thing about this mapping application, it has intuitiveness to it that allows for these queries to be created so it might help facilitate your searches and whatnot um, a little easier. So on this toolbar you'll see here underneath the, um, the, the address locator, it's like this little thumbnail. When you click this, it's going to give you this historical sites query builder. And on here basically what we've done is taken all the fields that are within the database of the historical data and basically parse them out so it allows the user, the end user, to be able to query by a little bit of information that they might have or to kind of narrow down your searches. Uh, what we have on here is year built, uh, we have addresses, uh, we have city or jurisdictions, um, parcel ID, you know, f the realtors out there that have these types of, uh, of bits of information can use that. Also the styles of the architecture. Um, the actual architect themselves. Um, we also have uh, themes, um, the exterior plans, and the site names. So if you have a, you know, an actual name of the site that you're looking for, you can put it in there. And it's, it's a pretty easy to use uh, uh, little device, basically, uh, within this map you would take, and if you wanted to f you know, search out by year of all the historical properties, you would click on this particular uh, button and it'll give you basically a prompt that'll say, you know, enter in something on here. So if, you know, like we can use, uh, what's that, 1925, let's just say 1900, you want to check. You'll notice on there that it gives you an automatic drop down as you, as you kind of go through. So it, it, it's broken it out by year. That's all <coughs> data that's in the database. So if, if it's something that's in there, um, it'll find it. If it's not in there, um, and you know that it's something that is part of the data going forward, it might be added in it at a certain time. So you could come in here and click on one of these and basically hit the apply button up top here. And what that's going to do is it's going to give you a searched list of all the data that's behind the scenes. And it's also going to flag each of those particular properties that are on the map. So if you knew of something that was, say, built in 1920 and so you know it's in St. Pete, but it's you know in that cluster of points down there that's kind of hard to find. Well, you can come down there and, and pick on those. If you click on any one of these in here, it'll zoom right to the exact location and it'll flag it for you. And then you can click this zoom to and it'll take you down even further. Um, along that same line that when it's flagged, you can click on that flag and, hold on a second, click on the point and it'll give you all the information that Brian just went over before, uh, all the background information regarding that particular historic property. Uh, it's also useful too that if you, um, and we added the base maps on here that you could take and switch to aerial views so you can get kind of a real world idea of, of what it is you're looking at and um, you know, the, the searchable properties around that particular uh, search from there. To basically go back, you would hit options and hit the queries again and say you want to go by particular architect. 
Um, again, a lot of these in this drop down here are, are based off of what's in the database. Some of the stuff is complete, some of it's kind of incomplete, but if you have an idea or you know of the, of the architect and, you know, that's, that's there, I like this one because of Griswold. Um, it was my nickname in high school being uh, last name of Clark. You click that and it'll, it'll kind of zoom right in there again for you on the same functionality as, as the other ones will, as well. Uh, it, it's a pretty uh, intuitive little device that allows you to kind of zero down your, your search a little more. Again, you can do it by style. Um, you know, I don't know that there's many Art Deco places around here, but you'll see if there are some that are classified as that, it'll bring up all of those uh, particular uh, uh, buildings that are within the database as well. And again, you can, you can zoom to those locations uh, by clicking that flag and then by clicking the actual point itself, it'll give you all that information of that particular building. Uh, same things that uh, Brian went over before. Uh, the other thing on here too, which is kind of neat, is um, the, uh, let's see, where was it? Like the site name. If you know of a particular site name in general, um, this has the same logic behind it that as you start typing things out, say you don't know the spelling or the exact site name, location, uh, you know, the name of it exactly. You could type, start typing it in here, and what it'll do is it'll bring up the search in the database. So if you're looking for like the Vinoy, and you know, you kind of click down through, you can see there's a couple things that pop in here for Vinoy. Uh, you know it's the Park Hotel, so you click on that, click apply, and again, it zooms it right into the location where you're supposed to be at. And again, it'll give you all that information and of course a link back to the property appraiser's office if you need that type stuff too. And it is cool to work with this with the, um, with the aerial imagery because you can get a really good idea um, you know, what it is you're looking at. All these function uh, with the phone as Brian said as well. Uh, same, same queries, same setup. So the, the logic behind it is very easy to, to, to utilize and, and get the full functionality of the database. And you can also utilize that with the tools above that Brian showed before to get more information, you know, at the bottom of your screen with the actual data. So it's real important for, you know, people out there that are in development or real estate or whatnot, or even in the, the, uh, the tourism aspect of it that you can, you know, kind of zoom in and, and get more uh, of a broader idea of what, what it is you're looking at with these queries. And um, that's pretty much it. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to use. It's on this little button right here. And you just click on that and it'll bring all that stuff up for you. So, you the, the aerial, you go into the base map gallery right here, up at the top, these four little squares. If you, if you hover over any of these, it'll give you a pop-up of what it is. And you just click on that and it'll drop down all those base maps that are available for you to choose from. <coughs> so again, you can you know, choose from any of the ones that you know, are on there. Any other questions regarding that? Okay, cool. I'll hand it back over to John. All right, we're, uh, wow, well, we're, no, we're good, we're good. We're coming up on, uh, on the end of this segment. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I see a question. We'll take questions. That's what I'm going to do. I'm sure that as you go through, through the, this, this flows off of these guys out of their, their mouths and their brains like water off a duck's back. They just know it. Are there any questions now about how to navigate this? You've got the handout, okay? Um, so dur during the course of the break, if you have any questions, I'm sure Brian and Steve will be able to uh, answer them for you. Feel free to, to ask them. Yes, David. Uh, John, um, if any of the municipalities have historic locations that are not on this map, uh, is there, can they apply to have them put on, or is this pretty much from the state? No, absolutely. If, if there is, if, if anyone knows of a site that is not in this database that they think should be, by all means, forward that information as much as, of it as you can to us. And I'm going to say, and Liz, you tell me if I'm wrong, is the contact button I showed you on the website is the place to do that. That goes to a central location. There are several people within the planning department who will look at that um, on a practically a daily basis, and then we will act in, uh, with it, with, within the ability of the staff to do that 
based upon their other responsibilities. But by all means, yes, if you know of something um, that you think should be, is missing or should be added, uh, by all means, send that to us. Any other questions or comments before we break uh, for a couple of minutes? We're going to start promptly with uh, Leroy Bridges and some hands-on training in social media and how to use it in a historic context. We have a surprise uh, visitor. Uh, let me introduce our leader and, uh, and one of our county commissioners, Charlie Justice. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? This morning go well? This morning go well? There we go. Um, uh, as your county commissioner, I have the privilege of chairing the Historic Preservation Board, and, and it's the board members who've worked very hard to put on these summits, so uh, I wanted to make sure. We had a commission meeting this morning and a commission meeting this afternoon that we just finished, so I was able to get over here. So, um, But I wanted to make sure that we recognized uh, and appreciate the uh, work of our Realtors Association for letting us use the facilities, our uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau for everything they're doing, our county staff, and, uh, and I did want to recognize by name our Historic Preservation Board. I know they stood up this morning, but um, Brian Smith, who left, John Berry, who you know, Wally Clark. Where's Wally? Standing against the wall. Uh, Gina Clayton, Emily Elwin, I know is out of town. Ray Claire Johnson, uh, Vincent Luisi, David McNamee. Is David here? There he is. Uh, Cindy Terrapani, she... And then uh, Matthew Abarius and Susan Elfman are alternates. I don't know if they're there. But, um, and I also want to uh, recognize uh, our former commissioner, Sally Parks, who was here. I thought I just saw her walk in the room. Uh, I see Sally. Sally seems to be busier more now as a retired than she was when she was a commissioner. So that's a little scary to me. But um, again, I want to thank you very much for being here and participating. And we look forward to your participation as we move forward with preserving historic properties uh, in Pinellas County. So thank you very much for being here. John? Thanks, John. Uh, I thought maybe we could uh, run a little experiment here. Did a lady, when she introduced herself, said that she was here to see if her site was, her property was historic. Is that someone over here? Oh, she left? She probably found out it was historic. Now she wants to go and make the, take advantage of that, right? <laughs> All right. Does, it, does anybody have a property that they've got they can give us a dress and we'll run a live experiment here? Yes. 325 49th Street North. Okay, my friend, I'm going to let the experts do this. No, but your neighbors across the street are. <laughs> 340 is and 302 is. So how did that happen? I couldn't tell you. So is this a process that is initiated by the owner or? It's a date. It's not. Predicated just by the date of the house, because mm -hmm. there'd be a whole lot more stuff there. The one thing I'm noticing is that these two sites have a identifier that is coming from the state database. Right. So. But no, how does he get the historical designation? Oh. How does that little report, whatever that says there, right? Who fills in that data? I'm not. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> so Florida site, master site file, where what this database has been fed from, is literally your cities that are designating districts, and they're sending, and so the contributing structures in the districts are feeding these, or individual sites by homeowners or property owners are sending this, the data through through a national register of their local landmarking processes. So even though the home may be a beautiful 1920s historic home, it may not be in this database, but that does not mean it's not historic. Right. So That's kind of my point. understand that clarification, especially with realtors. It may be eligible for designation. It's just never been thought of to have been done by a previous property owner. And if I could add just one thing, you need to look at your city to see if your city has a historic district in the area that you are. If it's within a a district that they claim is the historic section of your community, you need to start with the city first because technically they would put you in line with the National Register. So you need to see the layout of your city and see where you sit in that district. Uh, so that, yes, go ahead. Speak up because the, uh, so the whole room can hear you, please. If it's a local district, whether it's National Register or a local district protected by the ordinance, you need to see the 
um, do you want to find out you know, what you know what you can and can't do with the property? Um, and do sometimes people, you know, in real real estate, they know all these things that are negated. What can we try to sell this property because it's in a historic district and we can't do this, we can't do this, like you can't do them, whereas there are a lot of possibilities in this district. I know Ryan probably could talk more about that since that's his profession. But certainly tax abatement and other programs are definitely uh, Candidate for a topic at summit number four. Uh -huh. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, this was actually a, a good exercise because it it demonstrates the problem. Okay, and that is this: it, uh, buildings become historic designations largely in one of two ways. The all-powerful Historic Preservation Board has the power to do that. That is generally viewed in the, in, the, in the public as a negative thing. And we talked about that earlier in terms of the, of the benefits of historic preservation, i.e. historic Old Northeast, i.e. Kenwood. Um, so it comes from boards like ours, but it also comes from individuals and groups who see a property, question whether it has the characteristics that warrant designation and then stepping forward and, and actually going through the nominating process. Now that can be you as the homeowner, it can be you as the neighbor. If you're the neighbor, be careful <laughs> because that may not be so well received. But it does demonstrate this is a database that resides and has been collected at the state level all of Brian and Steve and all these people have brought it down locally and you see the result. We've got a tool here now, but it's far from finished. It's a live working document. So view it that way. Let's expand it with buildings that are worthy of designation because I think as preservationists, all of us want to see as much of that fabric restored and remained in our community as possible. And then the next challenge to us is to document it in such a way that it becomes part of our tourism in Pinellas County. So with that, I'd like to move on with the program. We're still uh, within our parameters. Uh, this next session is hands-on training, and I'm pleased to present, uh, we called it 2.0 because Leroy was with us once before, um, but it was so fast and furious, we thought, let's bring him back. We've got an hour on the calendar for him, but let me introduce to you um, Leroy Bridges, who is media and content manager at what is now called Visit St. Pete Clearwater. It's the old convention and visitors bureau. I like Visit St. Pete Clearwater better. Let me just share with you a tidbit. One of the things that we have done on the aside, not just to, that we've been able to do with the board, is work with uh, St. Pete Clearwater to the point where now in the publications that they are sending out, you heard my reference to the fact that they only mentioned five historic sites in Pinellas County in, in literature. They are open to expanding that and the new mailings that will go out in the future here in 2015 are going to contain an expanded uh, coverage of historic tourism in Pinellas County. We've got a long way to go there but we've taken a first step and we're really happy about that. So let me introduce then Leroy is, social, uh, is the social and digital media uh, first uh, tourism marketing professional with Visit St. Pete Clearwater. In between creating epic experimental videos and sharing his best iPhone photos on Twitter and Instagram, he manages the worldwide media and content efforts of Visit St. Pete Clearwater, including public relations, public relations agencies in New York City, the UK, and Germany. I give you Leroy Bridges. Thank you. Uh Thank you for, uh, to Commissioner Justice for having me and John and the board. Uh, thank you guys for giving up your time and for being here. I know social media can be uh, a uh, topic that produces anxiety uh, for some, uh, challenging and maybe uh, difficult to, to understand kind of its place in the overall scheme of what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I hope to ease some of those nerves. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, I want this to be casual I want this to be engaging. Please, if I'm speaking in a foreign language, stop, raise your hand, ask a question. Uh, this is really, uh, as John mentioned, 2.0. Um, I, I really just kind of brushed a, a broad stroke last time over social media, and I want to dive deeper into the separate channels, Facebook and Twitter specifically, and allow you guys to, to ask questions and, and me to hopefully show you the ropes a little bit, 
answer some questions, some do's and don'ts, that type of thing. So uh, please don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me, uh, raise a hand or whatnot. Um, just a couple quick slides before we get into to some of the channels. Why social media? I get this question a lot um, because some don't understand the value or, the, or kind of how it fits into the entire puzzle. And these are a couple reasons why. It's, it's, it's just one piece of the whole marketing puzzle um, and, and it's going to where consumers are. And so what I mean by that is not everybody now obviously subscribes to a newspaper. They might not be watching TV. They might be streaming from Netflix or Hulu. Um, so you have to find different ways to reach the consumer with your message. And social media is one of those ways. It's not the only way. Uh, it's, it, it is a part of our mix as an organization, as a marketing organization, and it should be part of your mix as well. It's one piece. It's not all. It's, it's, uh, and, and I think it should be, as we move forward, a larger and larger piece. As I put on here, it's, it's growing. You know, it's not going in the opposite direction, just like the use of mobile phones, smartphones, video consumption. It's all on the go. It's with you all the time. Um, just about everybody has a device in here, which was, I know, kind of uh, recommended to follow along, but everybody, you're connected at all times. Um, so we'll start with Facebook. I, like I said, I just kind of want to dive in and run through the platforms and, and hopefully you guys have some questions about maybe, okay, I'm doing this, but I, I don't quite understand why. Um, for Facebook, uh, for us, the three main reasons why we're using it is as a source of inspiration. You know, we're, we're trying to inspire uh, people to visit the county, Pinellas County. Um, and and one, one of those ways we're doing that is with experiential content. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more in depth and, and ways that you can get to that on your own end, but also influencing decisions. Um, I put on here, just to give you an idea, we have 197,000 likes on Facebook right now. When I started uh, three and a half years ago, uh, three years ago, we had about 170,000 likes. Um, Facebook, what, the, what that demonstrates is how much Facebook has really changed over the last two, two and a half years. And it's really changed a lot in, in how you reach the consumer. And as I go to Facebook, I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, it's become more of a pay to play uh, platform. And, and some of you may, not, may know this, may not know this. As I flip over to Facebook here, this is just your typical uh, news feed. But not everything you publish on Facebook reaches who you want it to go to. So you've got 700 friends, you make a post, it doesn't reach all 700 people. Facebook determines by an algorithm of who that goes to. And they determine on who that goes to based on how good the post is. And they define that on a number of different levels. One is a photo. If you use a photo in your post, it's automatically more popular than if you don't use a photo. So I don't have a, the pointer plugged in, but that top post that's in Spanish is not gonna reach as many people as this second post, which is a photo, well, actually it's a video, uh, we'll get to that in a second, just because of what it starts out as. Facebook says more people are gonna interact and engage with a photo than they will with something that's not a photo. So they limit the reach. Does that, does that make sense? So automatically, so as an or marketing organization, yes, go ahead. I'm confused. Maybe if you have yep. you sending to your friends, it yep. won't go to all of them? Correct. It doesn't. And so you, you may uh, just run a test over the span of a week on your own profile, for instance. Um, I noticed this. When they, when they first started restricting the reach, years, uh, it was about three years ago, and implementing this algorithm, um, and it's, it's all done to make money because they, they want to make money on the business side. I wasn't seeing all of my friends' content. What's going on? And sure enough, I'm still friends with them. It's just that face, there's too much content on Facebook to get it to everybody that they want to. So run a test, maybe pick out a friend or two and say, and just see just throughout the week if you see their content and then go back to their, their page and say, wow, they've updated five times. I haven't seen any of it. And that's Facebook determining what you see. Yeah. I also noticed that different devices have different content. That it's like I've looked at it on my phone and I went back to my computer and it's not there. Yep. Yeah, and what Facebook is doing there is determining yeah, what device you're on. They know that you'll engage in certain 
type of content more frequently on your phone as opposed to your desktop. Or they're saying, well, he saw this content on Facebook five minutes ago on his desktop. Let's give him something else on his mobile. It's smart enough to do that. And so just, just at the very, the very basic principles of Facebook, it, it kind of rocks your world a little bit. If you did not know that everything you're publishing reaches everybody, I mean, that, that's kind of... It's kind of scary because you, you have, in this case, maybe a, a Preservation Society page, or in our case, uh, Visit St. Pete Clearwater page, 197,000 likes, but a post yesterday that we posted, a sunrise, beautiful sunrise in St. Pete, reached 17,000 people. Well, where are the other... 180,000 people. They didn't disappear. They're all on St. Pete Beach right now. Right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Crowding your roads. And, yeah. So the point is, is that you, everything you post to Facebook isn't going to reach everybody. I think that's very important to understand. It's the basic principle and how uh, Facebook has evolved over the last two to four years. How to reach those other people. And that's why on one of those slides it said free, kind of. Because what Facebook has done is said, if you want to reach everybody, so you can. You can pay. So this, this varies depending on your page and your audience. But this is, this is a practice I would encourage you. If you, if you do have a, a Facebook page for your group or maybe you're a real estate agent I know, a realtor, I know there's a lot, uh, a lot, social media is playing a huge role in that, that industry. This is a practice I would say to, to use, but use very um, uh, cautiously and strategically because it can get expensive. This varies, this, the cost depends on the amount of your audience, right? So for us, if I wanna reach 100 to 200,000 people, which is in my range of likes, about 200,000 fans, I have to pay Facebook $500 for this one post. So if I, I can do that if I want, it's obviously not very cheap and becomes uh, very expensive quickly, especially if you're a small business. It's one of the reasons why I'm not very pro Facebook, to be honest with you. And if I was starting a, a, a business profile digitally or socially today, I wouldn't even create a Facebook page. I know that sounds crazy. It's the largest social media channel. It is. But to become relevant and to become heard and to reach your consumers you have to spend money and a good amount of it. So here, I'll, give, I'll show you some examples. Um, St. Pete Preservation. I think somebody was here in the room with them, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, a couple people. Um, a great organization. And in particular, do a lot on social media. Very active. 20 hours ago they made a post with a photo. That's a great start, right? Because you've used a photo, not just text. So you're allowing yourself to reach more people. Does that principle make sense? You're already saying, okay, we're off to a good start. They've got almost 4,000 likes, which is a pretty good sized page for, for all, all uh, points of emphasis here. They got 12 likes and one comment. 13 people engaged with that post. So I start to ask myself with 4,000, almost 4,000 likes, is it worth it? It probably reached maybe three, two or 300 people. I'm not sure what the final reach number is. You can only see that as an admin of that page. I'm a huge social media fan. I, I use it every day and I use it to, to promote tourism in our area, but I don't think necessarily that Facebook is the answer. Um, if you do think it is, continue to do so, and, and, and that's what we do, because we do have such a big audience. What happened was, before Facebook changed, we built up a following to 170,000 likes. The problem is, if you haven't built that up bef now in, in, in the kind of the ecosystem that Facebook is today, it's very expensive to get to 170,000 likes. We got, we got there for free, but then the, the Facebook business model changed. Does that make sense? So before they changed the game, we were able to get out of the gates. It, just in the last three years, we've gained 20,000 fans. That's not very many. I mean, it's a lot, but it's not very many compared to 170,000 that we had.
right? So the growth has slowed down massively. And it's because I don't want to pay the money to grow the page. So we continue, uh, Della Zida, like, now she's uh, one of our, our colleagues, she's in the audience, she's hel she helps me out, out a lot with social media. Uh, we continue to post and, and, and nurture our Facebook audience, but not to the level that we, we're gonna pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get it to grow. That audience is very important and very dedicated to us, um, but to get the growth that we used to get is just not, it's not financially responsible. So we'll scroll down here, just a couple more examples. Again, this is, this is great work, and, and you can't expect necessarily anything different from St. Petersburg Preservation. It's just that the, the model, the ecosystem that they're in, isn't allowing them to succeed and reach people. So six likes, one comment, one share. You get the point. It's not really reaching 4,000 people. You say, well, and, and that's what over time has become deceiving. People say, well, I've got a great Facebook following. I have 10,000 likes. I don't really care about likes. I want to know how many people are engaging with your posts on a consistent basis. That really shows you how many people are, are into what you're selling. <clears throat> My point here is that if you're not <clears throat> actively ready to invest in Facebook, I think it's a struggle to put all your eggs in that basket, which I'll, I'll get into Twitter in a second because that's my, that's my favorite pl platform. And I know it's, it could be challenging to say, well, I just got Facebook down. Now you're telling me that, that you need to move to Twitter. Um, kind of, sort of. So with Facebook, an another, big, another big key here is that the presence of video in, in, in our daily lives. I'll go back to the personal example pardon what you might or might not see on my news feed. So the first one here, again, a ridiculous video. The point is how popular video is and how much video people are consuming. You may or may not notice this on your own news feed. Again, do a test right now. Pull up Facebook. Scroll through your news feed. How many videos are you seeing in your news feed? See, there's one right there. Autoplay. You're, you're going to see a lot. And, and maybe some of you have already noticed this. Um, and and uh, to this gentleman's point, the experience on mobile is gonna be different. You will see more videos on mobile than on desktop. Here's another video, another video. The question is, why are you seeing so many videos? It's because people are watching videos constantly. They're consuming video left and right. The point is, if you can create video to showcase your society, historical buildings, a tour, whatever it is, do it. That would be the first thing I would say. Create video and put it in as many places as you, as you can. Here's another one. I'm a Boilermaker. Can't wait for Thursday's game. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Go Purdue. I'll go back to our channel. When we post video, I could post a, and, and, and just a good example, I could post this beautiful sunset photo and I could post a, a video of that sunset and the video is going to outperform it by 10 times, yeah. maybe 100 times. Because what happens is you're scrolling, people scroll through their timeline, and they stop. The video starts playing, they stop, and they watch it. They won't necessarily hit like on the photo automatic. Yeah? How long should the video be? Um, it varies on, on what type of platform you're promoting it on. Um, I would say, you know, for something like Facebook, it could be as short as 10 seconds. Um, I wouldn't, traditionally, I don't try to go any longer than 90 seconds to two minutes. As you guys know, attention spans are getting shorter by the minute or second. And um, we create a lot of in-house content on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is pretty robust, and it's a good time to plug it. Um, we actually have a lot of communities in here represented on our YouTube channel. And I'll just go there right now. Um, and take a look. Just scroll through at the videos we've got. Um, you'll probably find some that you can use uh, maybe in your, your own efforts uh, with the area. We did this really cool one recently, camping VW style. There's a, there's a company, old school campers, I think, in Pinellas Park. Um, we're really showcasing all kinds of cool aspects of the destination through video. And why? Because that's what people are consuming. They want video. They don't necessarily want to read something as much. I mean, it's certainly, there, and when I say a lot of these things, they're not you know, blanket statements. But you can scroll through there and find uh, some very cool video content that touches all the way from eclectic history museums like the automobile uh, uh, museum in Pinellas Park that maybe not many people know about to the, uh, the
the History Museum, I believe it's in Pasa Grill. It talks all about, it shows you all kinds of different uh, bathing suits through the years, um, all kinds of video content. But back to this. Um, so this, a, a post today, it's a, a video from Clearwater Marine Aquarium. If we would have posted a, a picture of this otter, it would not have performed nearly as well as this video, which has already reached 11,000 people in five hours. Um, it's, and it's super cute. Who, whatever you get. This is another example. This is, um, and, and I'll talk about creating video because I know that that can be uh, maybe nerve wracking. Like, I don't have money. I don't have the money to create video. And I'll tell you how to, there we go. That's a good example. Somebody's playing our video. I love it. That's our live amplified uh, commercial spot. If you watch it, get ready. It's going to get stuck in your head. Commissioner Justice is covering his ears. You will be singing it to bed. Um, so this, this is just, uh, this is called a hyperlapse. This video right here from the, uh, I think the eighth floor pool deck at the Hyatt. If you have an iPhone, this app is free. It's called hyperlapse, you can download it. What it does is it takes the video that you are taking and speeds it up automatically. It's called hyperlapse. Lapse? Yep, lapse, like time lapse or <coughs> lapse of judgment. What it does is it takes a short burst of video and speeds it up. So this is a 45 second video, but it probably was uh, three to four minutes of footage. And you can see in a very short amount of time, 45 seconds, somebody can actually watch the sunset. And this video has performed pretty well, almost 8,400 views reaching 30,000 people. It's, that's pretty good for Facebook. Most pages on Facebook, uh, marketing, business, whether you're a, a real, realtor, or a preservation society, they're gonna reach about 1% of their fans. So, yeah. How does Facebook decide who it's gonna send them to? I mean, if you, you said you had some very dedicated uh, Facebook people, yep. and they're not getting the things that perhaps you're sending out. Um, they, they base it all about your behaviors. So if somebody, uh, and it, it can be kind of counterintuitive, in my opinion. Uh, just because I'm liking maybe a post of yours doesn't mean I want to see everything you do, but that's, what's, that's what Facebook takes it as. So, so if I were to go on your site yep. every day or yep. twice a day, then I would be more apt to get all exactly. of the things that you send. If I went on there and liked you once and haven't been back, I'm not going to see this stuff. Very likely. Okay. So that, that's what I'm saying. If, you, if you're amassing all of these likes as a realtor or some, some other business, it doesn't necessarily mean anything if they're not engaging with your content. It's just like your friends. The people you haven't seen content from, you likely just scroll past a post nonchalantly, not really thinking about it three months ago or six months ago. And thus now they don't exist. Um, I, you know, I, I don't really like it, but it's, it's Facebook's model. They want to make money. And in fact, on the personal side, you can pay to, to boost your post too. This boost post isn't just allowed for businesses. If you're really uh, that egotistical or whatever it might be, you can say, I really want all of my friends to know I got this promotion. You can pay to do that. I don't know who does. But the point is that you really, with Facebook, if you're not going to pony up, you're really out of control. Facebook is controlling who sees your content when. I'm not really a big fan of that, and I'll go into a little bit more. Yeah? Um, I work with cultural programs, and we're, we are using Facebook and, of course, regular print ads. Yeah. Um, are you going to talk about the print media at some point, or just, just social media? I can, yeah. I, I, I just, certainly can. I'm just wondering, do you think there's a balance in you know, what we're all doing? Cer uh, certainly. Um, also, there. if you could speak to the categories that you choose when you're trying to do an ad. Um, there have been some really interesting studies about you know, people who like this are more likely to do that and they're not in any category that you'd ever imagine. So. Yeah, it, th that's a good point. Um, as I said at the beginning, it, it's, it, it's definitely a mix. And, and for, for our organization, I dabble in some of the marketing, but I'm not uh, at the table for all of the conversations with our advertising and marketing decisions. I can tell you that we still do a good amount of uh, print traditional advertising, you're right. Again, it's, it, for, from my perspective, 
you know, you, you do a print ad because you're trying to reach those who are reading that magazine. I'm maybe doing a Facebook post to reach those who are on Facebook, and maybe those audiences overlap, maybe they don't, but there's a, there's a place and a time for both. Um, we can maybe dive a little bit granular into some of the more specific ad choices and decisions a little bit later if you'd like. Um, so with, with the video, the, again, just kind of my ultimate point with Facebook, it's a great tool, and hopefully some of you guys have been able to establish some presence, but it, if you're feeling like you haven't been able to build an audience or connect with people, I feel your pain. I mean, it, not, not, we're all together, right? It's a struggle because Facebook's model wants money. Um, the other point with, with, in terms of creating video, uh, this young woman held up her phone. Um, hyperlapse is one tool. Really just using the video, the camera itself is another. You can just, you don't have to use a hyperlapse. You can just pull it out, just like you would take a, a photo, take a video, and just use it as an experiment. Uh, if you are managing a page, or somebody else is managing a page, pass that along, pass that information along, because I think it's valuable. Um, let me go back to the PowerPoint real quick. We talked about videos, photos. The other big, big, key, big key with with Facebook, and and this is uh, an opportunity and a, a place to grow your audience is by engaging with others. So, uh, if you are stagnant, if you don't, if you don't feel like you're really making any momentum, you don't want to spend any money because it's kind of um, expensive. What you can do is go, go and engage with other uh, groups, pages. We have a pretty robust page. If you want to go on there and say, hey, love the shot. You know, of course you don't want to be too forward and sell to people in comments. But for instance, um, let's see if it comes up. Nope. Uh, I love the Berg St. Pete. There it is. They uh, posted, used that beautiful sunrise photo Della took um, the other day on their page. And so instead of just letting that post go out there and just hang out, what we did was we liked it and then went and commented, thanks for sharing. And so what that's potentially doing is exposing not just, of course, they used our photo and they tagged us, but those who are engaging with that post will see our name. And if they are doing the same process or see the photo in their timeline, they're going to see our comment and potentially say, who's visit St. Pete Clearwater? Click on it and perhaps like and engage with our content. So I would empower you guys to do the same thing. As a brand or as a person, you can like pages, right? And so you've got a news feed. This is our Visit St. Pete Clearwater news feed. These are posts of organizations that we've liked. So on any given day, we go through and we'll like, like this video of this tortoise eating a leaf, which is very cute, again. Comment, like, and perhaps their fans and followers will see us. Again, I'm not saying, hey, come like our page. It's very discreet, just engaging with people. So this is really the best free way to try and build your audience. Besides great content, um, is, is liking engaging with other brands that make sense or that really fit into what you're trying to do. Uh, beautiful sunset shots, from maybe from the Don Cesar or from some of these historic properties, um, really trying to connect with like-minded people. Again, in ways that it makes sense. Uh, we don't necessarily go to visit Tampa Bay's page, our counterparts in Hillsborough County, and like every photo and say, oh, love it. They probably wouldn't think very kindly of that. The same if you maybe went to another realtor's page or uh, an organization that didn't quite make sense for you. Um, so again, there are ways to, to build the page organically. If you just want to say, you know what, I'm not really a big fan of of Facebook either, Leroy, I'm with you. There's another alternative. Um, we talked about all those. And that's Twitter. And um, again, if you guys have any questions as we go, please feel free to, to raise your hand, ask. Um, don't hesitate. Big thing with Twitter, 
It's a lot like Facebook. Uh, engaging with people, experiential content, you're influencing decisions or um, kind of what they're doing in their life. The big difference, in my opinion, is it's more real time. There's a lot more flow of information. Twitter isn't going to limit what you see. And that's a big key difference. Well, if you log on to Twitter, uh, what Twitter essentially is, is just bite-sized pieces of information, 140 characters or less, in one place. It's just like a news feed, except there's a limited amount of space that somebody can provide on there. So this is our news feed. This is Facebook. Just look at it as Facebook. This is a news feed, right? And you can scroll through and see all different kinds of content. Just like your friends, these are people we follow. That's, that's all the only difference. The big key here is Twitter's not saying, hey, you know what? You liked this guy's tweet the other day, so I'm going to give you his tweet today. This is everything. They're not limiting what I see. So already I'm kind of excited because then that doesn't limit my reach as a brand or an organization, a realtor. The entire audience scope, a consumer database is there. It's there at, at kind of at my fingertips. So th the, the counter to that is there's a lot more information. There's a lot more stuff happening because uh, it's constant. The big, the big key here is, though, is that you can connect with people without them ever wanting to connect with you. That might, that might sound crazy. It might sound kind of scary. Um, but it, it allows you opportunity. So on Facebook as a brand, I can't go to your page, John, and say, hey, like my page. You really love St. Pete, like our page. You'll love our content. I can't do that. Facebook doesn't allow that. I have to wait for the consumer to come to me and like my page and then in, in taking my content. Twitter is different. So example here, pardon if you see anything inappropriate. What this, what this page is is called Hootsuite. H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E, Hootsuite. What this is doing is pulling in uh, the Clearwater one and the St. Pete. These are pulling in tweets all around the world. Every tweet in the world that has the word Clearwater in it is in that column. All the tweets in the world, St. Pete in that next column. By the way, Twitter's the second largest platform behind Facebook, uh, is growing rapidly. Instagram's catching up to Twitter actually quite a bit. We'll talk about that a little bit. So what this allows me to do is I've created a filter here, a keyword search. So I can scroll through and talk to these people if I want. So I'll show you a, an example real time here. So I'm scrolling through these, again, this is everything in the world. So you never, sometimes you're not real sure what you're gonna find. Sometimes you realize there are a lot more clear, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival fans than you ever thought. Um, okay, Brooke says, so I found a, this, this tweet right here. It's a great tweet. Pretty sure I'm moving to Clearwater, Florida. I think I'm in love. Well, this sounds like somebody who should be following us, right? Should be engaging with our brand because she loves our product. So what I did was I just clicked on that link. It takes me to Twitter where she published it. And there are a couple options on Twitter, two coupling options to engage. Again, if this was on Facebook, I can't necessarily do anything unless she comments on my page. If she didn't, she doesn't know I exist at this point. She doesn't know Visit St. Pete Clearwater is even an entity. She doesn't know you're a realtor. She doesn't know you're preserving historic buildings. Put in whatever you like. There's people having historical uh, tourism and preservation conversation online in Pinellas County that have no idea you exist, and you can tap into that. So kind of giving you a real-time example of how to do that, you can take it and apply it directly to what you're doing on a daily basis. It's powerful. It's really powerful. And if you do it in the right way, they appreciate it. They're flattered. They're not creeped out. <laughs> Big difference, right? Various levels of stalking. Which, yes, exactly. Various levels of stalking. And uh, this level particularly needs to be appropriate and strategic. So just like liking a post on Facebook, I'm going to favor it her tweet. So I just did that by clicking the star. She's going to get it. She just got a notification. She's likely on the beach sun tanning. It said, visit St. Pete Clearwater favored your tweet. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to send her a reply right now. So then I can send her a message as well. Ask her how the traffic is going. 
<laughs> I'm never going to bring up traffic. So happy to hear you love it as much as we do. Maybe even a little Live Amplified, which is our brand message. I could go either way. Include it, don't include it. It comes across little marketing and selling and, and kind of, mm. All right, so little marketing. So I'm going to cut I'm going to cut it off. Just just yeah, okay. All right. We've got two we've got two likes. It's going back on. So then I just tweet her. And so she just got this message. And because we have uh 33 almost 34,000 followers and we're a verified account, she's going to be so thrilled that we sent her a message. Seriously. It's going to might make her day. I know that might sound silly. But she, she's, she, it's just like somebody, maybe, maybe you can relate. There's somebody on Facebook who likes to post. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of happy. That, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe you don't feel that way. I do kind of sometimes. Back to, back to our account. We didn't always have 34,000 followers, and we weren't always verified. The, the verified is this blue check right here. Once Twitter says you're big enough and important enough, I'll give you one. But when I started three years ago, just like our Facebook page, I would have said 170,000 likes, we had 2,000 followers on Twitter. Very, very small presence. The rate of growth in Twitter dwarfs that of Facebook. 34,000 from 2,000. The number is slightly larger, but the percentage growth, it doesn't compare. And the reason why is because I can put this growth of this page in my own hands. Really, it's, it's up to me connecting with people. If I can go out there and connect and touch more people, they're gonna see who I am and say, oh, this is kind of cool, I wanna follow you. Wow, these people are they're preserving these buildings, this is a really cool effort, I like this. And what it's doing is, I'm not just, that person wasn't in Jacksonville, that person wasn't in uh, you know, the Keys, they're on our beach. And so it's a qualified audience, right? They like our product. So just like if, if, again, it's all about reaching the relevant audience for you guys, you could create a same search for historic plus Clearwater or historic plus St. Pete or any number of thousands of examples. And I've got cards. I could talk for days about digital media and social media and, and ways to leverage it. I'm very passionate about it. I don't know if you can tell. I'm always willing to answer emails and phone calls. So if you need, at some point, you need help with this, don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, who she Who she tweeting? So, we, so when you tweet, just, yes, exactly, just put it out there. Just like when you post to Facebook, you're posting to your friends, you're posting to your followers. But the, the big difference is Facebook, it's under this, it's in lock and key. It's kind of on this safe. Twitter, it's, it's out there. You know, for, so you can find some Facebook stuff, but really the only people who see it to a certain degree are those of your friends. Twitter, it's a, it's a lot more open. And, and so uh, I was looking here. She, she hasn't engaged back. But what likely is going to happen at some point today when she can actually see her phone and she's not in the blinding sun, she's going to say, oh, wow, cool, and she's going to follow. Um, it happens all the time. People engage with us constantly. So that's, that's the other thing is once you start engaging with people, um, let's, get, let's do another quick one real quick. Um, again, apologize if you see anything inappropriate. You can see this Clearwater feed is particularly uh, active, uh, obviously, just like maybe if there's a, a hot topic in, in the election or anything, conversations ebb and flow. It's spring break, it's spring training, Clearwater and St. Pete, it's our peak month. These keyword feeds are really active right now. Uh, yours, whatever you may decide to set up would flow. Here's Visit Florida tweeting about um, Nicholas at CMA. Again, they didn't tag me in this. If I didn't look in this feed, I would have no idea this existed. But this gives me an opportunity to engage with this post. What happens then? They've got 93,000 followers. All of these people retweeting it, which is a share on Facebook. That's all they're, they're passing, passing it forward. And they're going to get a lot more comments on this. Is it puts my name along with their name. I'm hitching my wagon to a bigger fish. Right? They've got almost 100,000 followers to my 34. He's adorable. I come up with these lines all the time, don't worry. You should say he's flipping adorable. Oh, I see. I like it. I need to. 
I could, I could, if I wanted to, I could share this to, to our audience, which it's great content that's coming from Visit Florida. That could be a good option. Again, this could be, uh, you know, you could, I encourage our, our partners all the time, our, our hoteliers and restaurants and attractions, use what other people in the destination are doing. Look outside your four walls, right? So if you're in Clearwater, share something St. Pete's doing that's really cool, uh, preservation. You know, it doesn't stop. People don't know, you know, the visitor, they don't know boundaries. They don't know where Clearwater stops and, and Largo begins. They don't. And, and we have to keep that in mind, too. People don't necessarily know that when you cross the bridge, you, you go into a new county. They don't. And, we, and so it's important for us to constantly be engaging with, with the people in the region, our partners in all kinds of cities. And so the point is, is that you can really leverage not just your content, that video you created, but look and see what cool video maybe St. Pete Preservation created, or I Love the Berg, or somebody else. There's tons of content out there, and leverage it. Oh, really? Yeah. Which which one? Oh, the Oh, yeah. He he uh, he's pretty big presence in the area. He follow follows us. Uh. So you can really uncover a lot of different conversations, topics, and dig deep. And again, the key difference is. You're not limited as to who you can reach and how fast you can grow. It's completely up to you, as opposed to Facebook that's gonna be a little bit more frustrating. And you're gonna say, why did you show this to just 30 people instead of my 400 likes or whatnot? I know maybe from zero to 80, really quick there, there was a kind of got pretty deep quick. If you don't know Twitter, if you've never heard of it, it might be complex, but again, it's very, the structure is very similar to Facebook in terms of what you can do and how you leverage it. It's just about trying to connect with like-minded people, people who care about preservation, historic tourism just as much as you do. And when you do, when you use these channels to do so, they fall in love. You know, it's like, oh wow, you found a new friend. Yeah. I mean, seriously, yeah. it, 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 that's how it is. Um, let's see if she did anything back yet. Oh. I haven't even made it to the actual beach yet. So, that's the next stop, though. It was not she love was with the beach, it's love with so, the man. So, yeah, if she's not even at the beach and she likes it, I mean, just think of the, the number of different places we can go here. I can, I, can, I can take one of our YouTube videos, say, hey, make sure you check out these cool beach bars. You should take a picture or, of everybody and then post it. Right? Sure. <laughs> all of these people will appreciate it. We're all pulling for you, bro. I promise, yeah, right? I promise I didn't pay her or know who that is. But this is, this is reality. That at some point, and of course, again, yeah, we're larger and we, but I have been doing this for three years with the account and it grows and grows and it takes time, but it turns into something that you can see. And it's, for us, it's kind of turned into a bit of a monster. It's constantly busy, but that's a good thing. We're touching more and more people with the St. Pete Clearwater destination. Um, and sharing things that they may have no, I no idea existed, videos, content, the museums, all of this other stuff. Yes, the beaches are the calling card, but there's so many other things, as uh, John mentioned. So. How many hours a day do you spend Good question. Sending, message, sending messages, and how do you measure the dollar returns that Nellis County businesses are getting in this effort? Yeah, the, the measurement um, is key. You want, you want to make sure and you pick uh, the KPIs, key performance indicators, right? And so we measure that in a number of different ways. We've, we've got a great platform called uh, Simply Measured. So reach, so this is the big thing. Just, just like all of those traditional outlets, the billboard or the print ad, you know, those are measured in, in uh, ROIs, kind of determined by impressions and, and, and reach. Those are the same metrics that we use here. And so, um, while some are more accurate than others, it's the same measurement that's used in traditional advertising or commercial. Um, in terms of ROI, it's, it, it direct dollars, it can be a challenge because we don't, you know, as, as some of you may or may not know, we don't sell a specific product as, as a visit to, uh, as visit St. Pete Clearwater. We don't sell hotel rooms. Uh, we market the destination to, to, for visitors to come here and book a hotel. So we, certainly we have, uh, a booking engine on our site and all of those things. Um, as a destination, the big picture, we look at bed tax. Now can I say that I contributed to the bed tax with Twitter? I certainly think I can. We had 150 million impressions on social media last year. I think that's a big number and there's, again, 
did I, do, did I get credit for all 35 plus million dollars in bed tax? No, but I think it's a piece to the puzzle, just like that print ad, just like that billboard, just like that commercial. And it all how kind of has a place. How many hours did they spend? Didn't ask the question. Okay. It, it depends. It depends on the day and what events are going on um, and the channels. So just like uh, print's a piece of the puzzle, Twitter's a piece of the puzzle. We've got uh, presences on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, Google+. And again, it's about reaching people where they are. You have 50,000 views a week on YouTube. And a lot of those people probably have no idea we exist in Facebook, YouTube, any of those others, or maybe have you ever even seen or been to their destination. But we're reaching them where they are. In terms of hours, you know, per channel, it's, it's I can't, I can't say exactly. It's a large part of what we do um, and what Della does in-house. We have a content team that focuses on working digitally, not just social media, but um, uh, digitally, creating videos, epic videos, experiential videos. So somebody says, I want a vacation there. I want Can you put videos into the Twitter? Yeah, so th that's one of the great integrations, actually. Uh, good, good question uh, of Twitter is that when you post, uh, specifically, you can, you can upload directly or YouTube videos, which uh, as I talked about, let's see if I can find one here. Put it on YouTube and then we'll it. Yep, it plays directly into Twitter. So when somebody, when somebody pull, they're on their phone, they don't have to, you know, I hate that. That's the worst, right? You're in some, you're in an app or you're on a website and then it goes somewhere else. Right. And I don't want to go there. You know, I'm on Twitter. I'm here. This plays directly right into Twitter. Uh, this in particular, this video is B-roll. We're promoting our film commission with this <coughs> film amplified. We have a film commission and a sports commission, whole nother story. But yeah, so somebody can consume video directly within, um, this was a video I shared that uh, last weekend, uh, Valspar Championship was setting up for the Band Perry concert. And so. so my, my friend works in, in advertising and he was out there actually doing. Social media. All, all the tweets, live tweets during the uh, tournament. Tournament, yeah. And so again, it's, um, it's not all of the marketing efforts. It's, I would say, as an organization, it's growing by the day and by the minute. When I started three years ago, it was a very, very small percentage of what we did, maybe 1%. I would say we're probably up to like 25% of, of what we do as a marketing, as an organization. Social media. And when I say social, content creation, digital media, so that the... the um, our blog, I feel ancient in the blogosphere. We, we just launched a new website and we are about to launch the blog. I'm kind of sad to say that sometimes, but, um, but yeah. So with Twitter, again, it, it, it's a lot more open. Instagram is the same way. We can, we can go in that direction as well. It, it's very open. Um, again, these are, these are photos. We, we're very proud <coughs> that we're able to showcase all different parts of the destination. Uh, from sunrises, sunsets, to beer, to uh, Blue Jays, to the aquarium. And, and the, big, the big key here is we try to highlight every nook and cranny of the community in different ways. Um, and there's a tool here if you are interested in Instagram, and I don't want to spend too much time on it because I know Twitter's uh, quite new to everybody. Uh, it's called Icono Square, And it allows you to do exactly what Hootsuite does. And this blows people's minds sometimes. Hashtags, you guys fairly familiar, Pound right? Sign. <laughs> Pound sign. Real quick, I heard a story. Uh, a friend of mine, a daughter came home from school with the school list and asked what a hashtag two pencil was. <laughs> <laughs> so it's reality, right? The, yeah, definition, the definition of this symbol, it's changed. Yeah. And in 20 years, you may not hear anybody ever say pound sign again. So anyway, it, it's really just a way to bucket items, to, to, to categorize items, to make them searchable. So just like a phone book, the yellow pages, hashtag pizza, right? And you would go there and it's all the list of pizza places. It's very similar. What, what we primarily use hashtags for and what a lot of people do are locations. Um, hashtag St. Pete, hashtag Clearwater Beach. And when I say hashtag, it just means the actual symbol, not the words itself. So I've typed in hashtag Clearwater Beach there. This is into Icono Square. 
which plugs into Instagram, there are 145,000 plus photos tagged Clearwater Beach on Instagram. You know what that means to me? Dollars, money. It's an audience that might not know I exist. And if I'm trying to reach them in any way, and I, they care about Clearwater Beach enough to take, hashtag it, they're taking time out of their day to brand it, basically brand it for us in the destination. So what I can do then, and again, if you see something inappropriate, I apologize. You, you, you don't know what, this is the entire world of Instagram. Obviously, these people are on the beach real time. Let's see when this one is. This is a nice family on the beach. 80 degrees in March calls for a beach day. This is at 3.53 today. This is about a minute ago. I'm the first person. I can like it. Glad you're enjoying it. Unless they tell you, though, you can't tell where they are, can you? Uh, correct. I mean, but you, you can, but you can't. Well, if you can see that they're from, is it Minnesota? Um, I can't, Indiana? Whatever it says on the, it's how they identify themselves. She did not say. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's just I RN, BSN. Although I can click, click here. Bikini competitor. I, I don't know. Oh, it's, it does say Tampa, Florida here. So she's local. But uh, still, it's, it's somebody local. And, and I think that's a big thing that's changed with digital and social media is uh, for our organization. Traditionally, we, you know, we market to, we market out of market, right? So. I'll, a lot of people locally don't necessarily know we exist because you're already here. We're trying to bring people here. So it's not necessarily important that you know, but I think digital and social media has changed that because it allows us to reach locals a lot faster than normal. I don't have to pay necessarily advertising or put, put up billboards or do an effort to say, hey, look, look who we are, connect with us. Uh, but we can do that socially. Um, so next time, maybe she'll share the photo with us or hashtag live amplified or tag us, and then all of her audience is gonna see us, right. and it's just a snowball. It just continues to give us exposure as a destination. Um, so the, the, the point here again is that this group of people, they've taken the time, and you can tell most of these photos are gonna be, are, are great shots, right? This is all good, good for us that the people are doing this. Um, this is a qualified audience. They love our product, they're here, they're engaging, they're sharing photos with this, so it gives an opportunity. Again, if I can try and translate it to your world, um, let's do hashtag historic. This is very broad, obviously, just the word historic. 665,000 photos on Instagram. We wanted to narrow it down, maybe historic St. Pete or something like that, preserve the burg or, or whatever. Um, let's see if there's anything historic St. Pete. There's 37, not, not as many, but some. And you'll see photos on here of places around, there's the, the YMCA, YMCA in downtown St. Pete. And you see this person actually, this is a good example, has tagged us, mm -hmm. hashtag BSPC. And when people say, what's that? They're going to click on that, and that gives us exposure. And again, just the snowball effect. In terms of reaching people, front of mind, it's a billboard on the side of a road, digitally. The more people we can touch and, and reach, same thing with you guys. And, and from a cost perspective, it's time, but it's pretty cost effective um, in terms of Instagram and Twitter, in my opinion. And the ability to reach people at your pace and control your own growth is really just up to you. Um, running out of time, questions, general questions on you're struggling with something on Facebook up to, uh, to anything. Yeah. Just a general question you're a little bit alluding to the quantification of these numbers. Yep. <clears throat> I'm sure there's other nonprofit representation in this audience. And this came up in a board meeting recently. Um, what are the levels of quantification that or you can maybe at least just maybe tell me who I can talk to about mm -hmm. this? We're trying to figure out when we're tracking our numbers and we're going to a donor saying, this is our reach, this is our audience, what should we be asking for? You know, where do we quantify? Because I'm sure there's got to be some methodology that all these marketing representatives in the corporate world are saying, we need at least 5,000 likes on Twitter or and Facebook sure. and followers on Twitter. 
to say you're going to get a thousand dollars from this. Yeah, so. I, I, at this stage in the game, I always hate to play the the light follower of game. It's all about engagement, and engagement means those people who are not only like you but are paying attention and interacting with what you do. It's more important. Let's say you have a thousand likes. Somebody else has five thousand likes. If 800 of your people are engaging, that's more important than if 300 or 5,000 are engaging. Does that make sense? Right. So my, my, my kind of counter was, would be to really try to find a way to justify, not, not size, but quality. I mean, quality and engagement within that, within that audience. And you can do that on the back end of Facebook. Facebook's done a really good job in but, terms of, but is there a way for us to figure out where the corporations or the donors um, in the corporate world are setting those quantification levels. I, you know, I, I don't know of any, and I know for me, when you know, we host a lot of media, worldwide media, the destination to showcase and go back and write about it. Those benchmarks fluctuate for me, depending on the person, the, the outlet, the medium, um, and again, just it. Again, I think as, as these channels have matured, it's dangerous to say, well, if you have 5,000 likes, you're in. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. You see what I'm saying? I understand that, but. And so what my hope is that I know there's a level of quantification that they're using when they say, you know, if I'm going to them for a $5,000 ask, yeah. but I have, I have the reach that they would really honestly give us $20,000 mm -hmm. because we're going to get their name in front of 20,000 people. Yeah, yeah I, I know that they have some level of quantification to do that. And so I'm trying to figure out how to figure dollars out where those numbers are. Dollars for reach. Is right. right. So I, I don't know the methodology <coughs> myself. I'm sorry. Other questions for Leroy? We got them, guys. Fire away. Yeah. Well, when you're, I mean, obviously you're dealing with a, a kind of a really focused area of, of tourism and people moving here possibly. And then you're also dealing with a much larger budget than anyone in this room. Yep. So you've kind of got those two things already. So in January and February, I was working on an apartment in Harlem. And riding the subway, what do I see? But the dances are on the subway. So how do you, you know, is that just in an effort to then complement what you're doing online? Or is that trying to reach somebody else? Or is that to balance that? It's, it's all part of the same puzzle. Um, but yeah, so our New York City is, uh, New York in general is our number one feeder market domestically. And so in the winter when they're freezing, we do a huge blitz in New York City and Chicago. And so yeah, that's part of our out of home marketing efforts. Certainly, and then in that ad, there's some digital components in there, hashtag live amplified. If they want to take that experience from an ad, top of mind, maybe they want to book a trip. We've been in that market six years really heavily, mm -hmm. and so uh, we built a brand there, and so that's what that is, kind of continuing that conversation. Uh, but digitally, all of this content, it, 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 they, they run you know, separate from each other, but they're there to support each other as well. It's kind of to continue that experience. Does that so, make sense? So it's not just to push people to the digital. You're actually no. using that as a separate Definitely. entity. Definitely. Uh, so when, you know, tracking, obviously, the URL hits and the website presentation from those ads, um, you know, we've got... Because you have a separate URL on those kinds of things? Correct. Uh, vanity URLs to track, okay. uh, whether it's uniteSun.com or you know, something like that that's, that's a little bit more specific than visitsandyclearwater.com. Um, but I will say that you know, when I started three years ago, I didn't have, from a digital social standpoint, I didn't have a budget. And so what do you do? What do you know? We're not giving money for social media. And so it's one of those things where at some point you make a priority, uh, put a lot of my time in it without any investment eternally, to be completely honest turn it into something that they said, okay. And, and as times evolved, and so was able to uh, make it a priority internally by having success, measuring those key key KPIs, key performance indicators, to show, you know what, that, that money you're putting in the billboard, I'm, I'm reaching more people actually with this. And you have no idea how many people are looking at that billboard. You know? The cars may drive by. Car, cars drive by, who, who knows who's looking at it? And then what happens once they look at it? Are they? You don't know that they're going there unless you're using a URL. So 
you know, I think it's, it's a conversation to be had. A lot of people struggle with it, you know, comparing the two. I don't think there's any doubt that you can. And, and uh, to be honest, everything digitally and socially is a lot more trackable than anything you do traditionally, unless you use that specific URL. So, yeah. So I see that you have to create a call to action on your, um, right there, in yep. your thing. What, what is the intention and how does that get used? So uh, that, that's obviously just trying to create, create a call to action and make people engage with the post, right? So go to this link, uh, like this photo, do you know, particular engagement with the post. Um, we put it into play occasionally here and there. Haven't had great success with it. I'm just wondering. Uh, yeah, I, the general rule of thumb with our social media. You name it something other than create. Well, no, sorry, that's <laughs> not on. You won't. You won't see that. Okay. That, so this is sorry. Okay. This is the admin view. Okay. So you won't actually see that on your side. All right. It's just for us. Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, it, yeah. yeah. See that As a realtor, actually, that's a really great tool for you if you have a realtor page. Yeah. Because you can actually say sign up here, right, or you exactly. can say get a free home value analysis. You can have them click there, and it'll bring a registration page and send you their information. So, so, so for I us, just didn't I thought that this was on their page. It was confusing yeah. me why. For us, you wouldn't see that, but okay. if you were a viewer, okay. generally speaking, we try to not sell too much um, in this space. We I mean, get sold. Share is a call to action. Yes, so those of you exactly. Who don't know. Exactly. Share, like, engage. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, I guess you've kind of been touched on a little bit, but maybe could you talk a little bit more about gauging how, what percentage should be of, let's say, of like a nonprofit organization, what percentage of their, of their marketing budget should be directed towards electronic media versus print, you know, traditional newspaper advertising? I think it all depends on the success. Um, I spoke to somebody in John's past recently. Um, that they've been running an ad, same uh, bulletin, same publication the last 10 years. And they asked them, what's the ROI? Same question you asked me, right? I don't know. We seem to get pretty good foot traffic from it. How many people? I don't know, three people or so. Three people. And that doesn't seem like very good ROI to me. If the, you know, if you get three people, sure, there's probably, let's say a dozen more that maybe saw it that didn't tell you. Uh, my, my response would say, start measure, try to find ways to measure those traditional efforts. The MD URLs are very easy, as I was talking with her. So instead of visit stpclearwater.com, you use something more unique that's uniteson.com in that <laughs> specific ad. And then every, all the visits you get to that, from that URL, you can track and say, oh, we had six visits from this ad. Take those same dollars, use it digitally and see what happens, and then make your decision. I wouldn't say ditch anything you're doing right now from digital or social. Make sure it's a sound decision, measure. And I think that's the key component with a lot of these traditional efforts with impressions and reach and all this stuff. If you're not using uh, strategic ways, sneaky ways to measure it, you don't really know what return you're getting uh, with that brand. I mean, you don't. QR people using QR codes, those have obviously long gone. Um, it's kind of, you know, one way you could do it. I say the easiest is you can go to URL. Not one that's like uh, sun.com slash one, two, three, four, five, because nobody's right. going to type that in there or whatever, but something that's short, catchy. They're like $19. You can buy unique or we, uh, it's a favorite pastime of us as an organization because you never know when you're going to need something, right, for a campaign. So anytime you think of something catchy, you buy it. Oh, I can use that. Buy it. $19. Just direct it to your main site, and when you need it, you can use it. Okay. Again, I've got cards. If you'd like a card, I'm happy to, to email, phone call. Um, hopefully, some of you guys feel empowered or, or, or can take back some, some good nuggets to use. Again, don't let it be uh, you know, intimidating. It's, it's just another piece of the puzzle. And uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you. Hopefully what you've experienced this afternoon, particularly in the last hour with, uh, with Leroy, um, is, uh, is opening your thoughts to new ideas, to get you out of the box. Um, I mentioned early on in my remarks when we started this afternoon that um, one of the things that we discovered as a board is that um, as well as Pinellas County 
and the beaches and so forth promotes tourism here. Um, one area that is sorely lacking is um, the publication and, and raising the awareness of the historic fabric of our community beyond a handful of well-known landmarks. So what the board has been trying to do is to raise the level of awareness by any means possible. And that's the reason that we've reached out and, and continue to promote a partnership between the Historic Preservation uh, Board and the community and, uh, and visit St. Pete Clearwater because they have a powerful uh, ability to promote. But what you've learned from Leroy this afternoon is if we begin to think out of the box, we can do it in lots of different ways. And if you don't have a budget for it, it's the kind of thing that you, I, I believe in the philosophy that you crawl before you walk and you walk before the, you, you run. We've all done that as we were born into this world. And it would be the same thing with any kind of social media. You do the same steps. You crawl before you walk, you walk before you run. You establish a count, you learn how to use it, and then you begin to, the ideas open up in front of you um, in, in terms of usage. Um, I, I feel a little bit awkward at the moment now because uh, we, we did spend this effort. I, I launched into the brave new world. I don't have a slide of it. All of you had a handout, which is our Facebook page, Pinellas Preservation Community. We announced this at the last summit, okay? <clears throat> if you are not part of that, uh, by all means, go there. There's a, this sheet tells you how to get it. It's a group, Pinellas Preservation Community. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is that the board, the Historic Preservation Board, has statutory limitations. Um, and we have a very specific charge from the, from the county commissioners in the legislation that established us. One of those was to promote historic tourism. But beyond that, we're all volunteers. We go back to our lives, whatever they are, at the end of the board meeting. We were looking for a way to set up a so-called, quote unquote, network wherein people who have interest in historic preservation could communicate. The board has the sunshine law and restrictions about it, so it's not necessarily a place that is conducive to the dialogue. So what we said is, is that we're going to divorce the network from the board. So John Barry individually went out and set up Pinellas Preservation Community. It tells you all about it on there, how to find it, how to join it. It's a public group but you have to get permission to join and then you're free to post. I post on there um, fairly frequently about articles or historic sites that I see that are not particularly necessarily in Pinellas County. The point is, is that we're gonna continue to try to pursue that, but after listening to Leroy's presentation this afternoon, I may actually have to step into and establish a Twitter account. Um, <laughs> I, I shudder at the thought, um, it will be a big challenge <laughs> for me personally, but uh, maybe it's time to, to do that. I've, I've taken great pride in, in recent years, particularly with my students when I was still teaching, saying, I don't tweet. Come and talk to me face to face or call me on the phone. And they're saying, Professor Barry, you're you know, way behind the times. And the truth of the matter is you have to start thinking about that way. Uh, we're older, not old, but we're older in this crowd, and so we use the traditional things. But if you look around you, at your nephews and nieces, your sons, your daughters, their, your grandchildren, they don't have a clue about some of the stuff that we take for granted. Their whole world of communication is different than ours. And you better believe that there are kids out there who convince mom and dad to come to St. Pete Clearwater. That brings up one quick point, sorry, is that I think that's what is so special about your group and the opportunity with social media is because there's, there's this whole generation or generations that maybe are on social but don't necessarily have the same passion with historic tourism and you do, and that's where all the opportunity lies. Is that you can, there's so many people and so much opportunity to reach and tell your story, tell the historic preservation story to these people that maybe at this point have all, they, all they've done is had their head in their phones and don't know the special uniqueness of a building on the street. And it just gives you that path to reach them that otherwise you might not be able to reach or tell that story to. So, no, it's a good point. Good luck on the Facebook. I think that's a great way to do it. Instead of empower others to sign up and post 
and become a community. And yeah. You all yeah. great success. All right, great. Okay, so so much for that. You, there's a flyer in the back. If you didn't pick up one of these when you, when you checked in, please do that. Join the group and post stuff. It can be, you know, the restoration of, I like to, I, I follow Frank Lloyd Wright um, judiciously because he's my absolute favorite architect of all time. And a lot of his work, as you know, is, pardon me? I said, is he still posting? Uh, <laughs> he isn't posting, but, but a lot of people on his behalf are posting. <laughs> no. <laughs> so anytime, uh, I, I, I got to tell you the, the, uh, a quick story. We've got a couple of minutes, and I won't, I won't bore you with this uh, too long, except to say that um, for those of you who know Frank Lloyd Wright, um, in Chicago every year they have the, the Wright Plus Tour. And on a Saturday morning, beginning about 9 o'clock until 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you can tour in Oak Park, Frank Lloyd Wright houses and other houses that are of significant, historical significance. The first time I went there, of course, the lines are huge. They process about 3,500 people through that tour on a Saturday in a period from 9 a.m. to about 5 p.m. Um, you stand in line outside a house. And you're twiddling your thumbs and you're trying to keep up a conversation with your wife and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the, along came a street talker, a volunteer. And I suddenly realized that I wanted to do that. So right before I left Chicago and came down here, I volunteered for that tour. And for, from 9 o'clock until 5 o'clock with two short breaks, I st stood outside of these different houses and I talked to people about Frank Lloyd Wright. It was the, one of the most fun times I've ever had in my life. How many mistresses did he have? I had all these questions, and I was really surprised at how many people actually knew the answer to it. It was, it was kind of fun. Okay, not just how many mistresses did he have, but all kinds of facts about Frank Lloyd Wright, abstract facts and useless information. So to get back to point, there's a lot of stuff that can be shared on that posting of ours, the Pinellas Preservation Community, that would be fun for people like us who have that as an interest. Okay, let's wrap this up now in the final 15 minutes. On your agenda, it says, the future of historic preservation summits. When I go back to the board, the next meeting in, uh, let's see, this is March and April, the first question that is gonna be posed to me is who is going to host and lead the next summit? The board has now sponsored, and we've put together, this, this is our third one, which we're very proud of, but it is not our mission, and we don't believe that we should always be running the show. So what I'm suggesting to you is, is that we are looking for other towns, organizations to host and assemble the next summit, which we think ought to be sometime in the September, October, November, before the holidays timeframe. We usually have done it coincidental with our third Wednesdays. We've done it in the afternoon. We've been in three different physical locations now. So my challenge to all of you is, let's step forward and somebody in Oldsmar or Safety Harbor or Largo or Clearwater come forward and, and, and build a theme around your community. It doesn't have to be all of you, but we've got this gentleman here who talked about ways of, of promoting, uh, what was it again, I'm sorry? You, when I nominated you as a speaker? <laughs> Please, <coughs> financing. Yeah, financing. Grants yeah. and how you find Okay, that can be a topic. So, so what we wanna do is feed off of each other the vehicle to do that can be the preservation, uh, our Pinellas Preservation Community, where we can post those ideas. You can also send me an email. I'll agree to be a conduit for or organizing this stuff because I'm a, I'm a pretty good organizer. Not a community organizer, but I'm a, a group organizer, okay? But we really want the board to, to step away from this now and for the preservation community to come forward. We will assist you. We will help you raise money. We do not have any money at our disposal as the board. So it's not a source of revenue. But we can get gifts in like kind. We had Atlas at one of our uh, sponsors uh, provided some refreshments. All we need is some, you know, some Coke and some water and a few snacks in the afternoon. It's not a big deal. If somebody wants to come forward and, and offer a happy hour with wine, I'll stay, okay? But the point is, is that we can help you organize. We will, we will 
use our resources to communicate, announce the events. We can help you find some speakers if you need them and something like that. But please, let's now have the community step forward and, and uh, uh, organize the next one if we can do that. So I'll leave you with that thought. Finally, uh, since we're wrapping up a few minutes here ahead of time, there was a survey form that was part of the package out front that when you came in, uh, we would greatly appreciate it um, if you have any comments, good or bad. We're big and grown people. If uh, there was something you didn't like, we'd like to hear about it. If there's something that you'd like to hear more about, let us know that. If you've got ideas for new program material at the next summit or you want to step forward, share that information with us, please. Let me close it by... Um, Opening the floor, has anybody got announcements that they would like to share with uh, the group assembled here before we uh, uh, adjourn about uh, future activities that are going on that you know of in historic preservation in our community? Anybody? All right, with that, I declare the third summit adjourned. Thank you all for coming, and we'll look forward to seeing you somewhere in the fall. <laughs>